Sly Cooper, a series loved by all except seemingly the people who made it. This series was fairly big when it first came out, and it has garnered a massive fan base, but sadly it's been pretty much dead for almost a decade. But why is that? Did the people making the series simply run out of ideas, or were there more underlying issues at play? Well, I think the only way to find out is by going back to the game's roots. <laughs> There they are. It got two sequels released on the same console, also made by Sucker Punch, a fourth entry for the PS3 made by a different developer, and they even released a trailer for an upcoming animated movie. In 2014, wow, that went absolutely nowhere. It's a 3D platformer combined with a stealth game. <gasps> that gives me an idea. Mario Gear Solid! Much like Crash Bandicoot, Sly can only take one hit before dying unless you grab one of these lucky charms lying around, a missed opportunity for a brand deal. And if this type of gameplay isn't your thing, don't worry, this is a mid-2000s platformer game, and you know what that means? COMPLETELY POINTLESS MINI-GAME LEVELS! Yep, a handful of levels throw in completely different gameplay styles. We can't have you platforming the whole time, what do you think this is, a platform game? It doesn't feel like they wanted to break up the monotony or try something new, this feels like variety just for the sake of variety. And I'm sorry, but say if I'm ordering a cheese sandwich, I just want cheese on it. If you shove paper in it for the sake of variety, then I'm not gonna be happy. Weird analogy aside, let's get more specific with these levels. The enemies are gangsters, and we have a level that combines everyone's two favorite genres, turret sections and escort missions. Goody, goody. Goody! You have to man this turret as Murray runs through the area and snag the key and shoot anything that goes near him. It's honestly not that hard as long as he doesn't run into your line of fire. Get out of the way! And finally, a level where you have to kill 30 chickens? Oh, hell yeah! Yeah, take that, you worthless pieces of poultry! Just don't touch the ones with the bombs or else... I am validated. Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. Sorry if I seem a little on edge, it's Halloween tonight and I'm not very thrilled. Now, don't get me wrong, I normally love Halloween, but I've been having to deal with some pretty crazy stuff the past couple of years. First aliens, then ghosts, so this time I'm gonna be prepared. There is no way a single monster is gonna get in here, and I've taken the ultimate safety precautions. It's not a full moon, so I shouldn't have to worry about werewolves. I've zombie-proof the box to keep those walking corpses out of here, and to get rid of the vampires, I'm going to be dressing up as their worst fear. They don't sell any garlic costumes, it was either this or a pickle. Regardless, I've got some sunscreen to ward off the vampires, it's got sun in the name so they must hate this stuff, and in case of an emergency, I've got my punch popper. But despite that, the series seems to be pretty much dead, since there hasn't been an original game in almost 10 years. Nice going, guys. Although I do question some parts of the layout. There's a bunch of platforms and staircases that go absolutely nowhere. Is it because the castle's falling apart, or did it always look this way? Because if that's the case, the architect must have been really tipsy. Thankfully, you have unlimited continues, but going back to all these levels can be really frustrating. Unless you're playing the Anniversary Collection, which lets you use save states. Yes, that is why I'm playing this version, and no, I don't care. This game is hard as hell, and these very easily saved me multiple hours of my time. What was that? Out of this box! Out of this box! The next area is where the game shows its true colors. Particularly this room where you have to jump over pits while avoiding Medusa heads. Crap, 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 crap. But even when you make it through that, you have to fight the Grim Reaper. Screw this stupid Deathbringer in a burlap sack! This is easily the most frustrating boss fight. He floats around and summons up to four sites. He doesn't throw them, he summons them out of nowhere. And they don't disappear, they continuously follow you until you either attack them or they somehow go off screen. But when they do, he just summons more! This fight is not fair or fun at all. Wait, what? Huh? <sighs> Great, the game froze. Thank you, safe dance. There are many moments where I swear it is impossible to avoid getting hit, and you might die in four hits, but he takes 16! Are you kidding me?! And the stopwatch doesn't even work here, that's just great! Come on, come on, just a couple more hits and I- Yes! No! No! You've gotta be kidding me! I had that! I freaking had that! He was 
dead, but the scythe hit me before I could grab the orb! Oh, come on! You stupid thing! I hate this, 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 I... One? How did I win? Seriously, how did I just win? I randomly did more damage than before. You know what? I'm not gonna complain. I spent an hour fighting that stupid thing, and that was with save states. Without save states, I don't even want to think about how long that would have taken. Ah! What? what the hell was that? It, it, seriously, what was that? I completely monster-proofed this place. I prepared for vampires, werewolves, demons, ghosts, witches, aliens, zombies. What could I have possibly forgotten? What could that have been? Think, 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 think. Wait a minute. I know what I forgot. The true monster of Castlevania. The most important element of the series. And it took my game. But I know how to get it back. We're gonna catch that monster using the one thing it can't resist. Sunscreen, these things eat the stuff up like candy. Now all I have to do is wait here and I'll have that thing in no time. Huh. Well, that was quicker than expected. Dang it, it was just a bear. Huh. What do you know? I guess that was what took the game. Hmm. Could have sworn it was something else. Hmm. Thought I heard something. Hmm. Felt like there was going to be something behind me. Wait, why was I going this way again? Oh right, I need to get back to my box to conquer the game. Oh, wait. I forgot to grab my sunscreen again. <laughs> I knew it! The one true monster of the Castlevania series! The castle! Uh, I gotta go! <laughs> This is bad, this is bad, this is bad, 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 bad. What do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Wait, when it out, go left. Phew. Well, there's no way that thing's gonna find me over here. Ah! Let's see. Vampires are weak to sun, witches are weak to water, zombies are weak to signs. What are castles weak to? Wait, I got it! The castle's true weakness? Brute force! Suck this, you bag of bricks! Yeah. <laughs> Gross. Why'd that have to be so messy? Castlevania is fun, but it is also really hard. It's not as challenging as something like Zelda 2 or Super Meat Boy, but it can be really frustrating, even though there aren't many parts of this game that are really satisfying to beat. I say you be the judge on whether or not you should play this game, but if you're hesitant, at least try it on the Anniversary Collection, because that way you can save yourself some time and some headaches. Also, remember to lock your doors at night. You don't want a castle following you home. Most insurance companies don't cover that. Hell, human beings, Power Gamer here. And brace yourselves, because this is it. The big one. The game that changed the course of history forever, blew people's minds so hard that they orbited Saturn, and proved that there is justice in this universe, because it made a game so unbelievably awesome, people will be willing to sacrifice their beloved goats in order to get their hands on this bad boy. It's Ocarina of Time, baby! But while the sales numbers were huge, the praise was over the freaking moon. Everyone hailed it as a masterpiece that was perfect in every way and changed gaming forever. Nothing would possibly be able to top this. So... a Zelda game. Yeah, I already talked about this in my Link to the Past review, but every console Zelda game has gone through a period where it's lauded as the best game ever, with a few exceptions. The most common criticism I see directed towards Ocarina of Time's story is that it's essentially just a rehash of A Link to the Past. And yeah, there are plenty of similarities, but I think Ocarina of Time does enough to stand on its own while also greatly improving on what came before it. Ocarina of Time is without a doubt the biggest Zelda game ever made at the time of its release, possibly the biggest game in general. And while that is really ambitious for the time, and I do give it a lot of respect for that, this leads to the game's biggest issue. Hyrule Field is dull. Outside the castle, you find Talon taking a nap. Well, he's in my way, so there's only one thing to do. 
Now you can enter the castle and avoid more guards who are really oblivious. Hey, hear anything? Nope. Make it to the center and you find some really cool easter eggs. There's this picture of Mario from Mario 64, and hitting this window with a slingshot leads to attempted child murder. On top of the previously mentioned Skull House, we have a windmill with this dude playing a music box and the Cuckoo Lady. She's lost seven cuckoos and wants us to find them. Oh, I'll get your cuckoos back for you, lady. Most of them are really easy, but there are a couple hidden in pretty weird places. And that's the last one. As thanks, she gives you a bottle. That's nice. Well, now that we have that settled... <laughs> Take that, you feathered freaks! I'm gonna turn you into some fresh... Huh? Oh no. No! No, please! Take it swarm! Ah! If you want, Dampy will give you a tour, which just means he'll dig a hole if you pay him some rupees. Okay, let's do it. Great tour! Go back to Goron City and play the song for Darunia. This leads to one of the best moments in the whole game. After that sick jam session, Darunia will tell you about Ganondorf and agree to let you help them. He then gives you the Goron Bracelet, which allows you to pick up these bomb flowers. Okay, one more time. Give the note to her father, and he'll let you pass him. This seriously takes a full 30 seconds. You find Rudo very quickly, and she tells you she can't leave just yet, but she still wants you to help her. So this whole dungeon is a giant escort mission, but she doesn't just follow behind you, no, 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 no. This spoiled brat decides to let you carry her around instead. Yes, you have to physically carry her across the entire dungeon. And if she falls or you leave her behind for too long, she goes back to her spawn point and has the nerve to get mad at you. Screw you, you snobby seafood! Oops, she died. Oh well. Link heads through the market and arrives at the temple. He places the three stones and you then play the song. This is what I was talking about when I said the story takes a massive turn. The fact that the world is thrown into chaos and destruction because of your attempts to prevent all that is really freaking dark, and it serves as an incredible motivation to want to stop Ganondorf since you need to fix the disaster that you created. But if you saw my earlier Zelda reviews, you'd know that my biggest problem with those games is how much they don't tell you about where to go and what to do, but this one seems to have some hints. So does this mean, after all this time, we finally have a Zelda game where you don't need a guide in order to properly beat? If you ask me, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Now Goron City is back to normal, and hey, that giant Goron finally finished his project. It's a new sword called the Giant's Knife. It requires two hands to hold, so you can't use your shield, but it does even more damage than the Master Sword, which is awesome, and it broke. Yep, it breaks, and there's no refund. Six years well spent. And what's Talon been up to with his ranch in the hands of a nutcase and his daughter being forced to serve him? <sighs> Screw this guy. Dive underwater and use the hookshot to open this door to... The Water Temple. A name that sends shivers down the spines of all players. A location that has been troubling people since 1998. A level so infamous it has its own Wikipedia article. No, I'm not joking. This is without a doubt the most despised thing in the entire game and one of the most hated areas in video game history.
Is it bad that I actually like it? It looks like Ganondorf finally caught up to this place because an invisible monster emerges from the well and throws Sheik around like a ragdoll. <laughs> the bottom of the well is another mini dungeon full of invisible holes and fake walls. It also has this monster. This is the Dead Hand. It has given many 90s children nightmares and it has given me a new profile picture from my Ashley Madison account. You start by talking to the cuckoo lady who thinks you might be good with cuckoos. She then bestows upon Link the power of the light arrow, since he'll need them in order to win. Wait a minute. You're telling me this is a Zelda game with a special item that is mandatory to beat the final boss, and it's just given to you? It's not hidden away in a secret room that's very easy to miss, and as a result... There's no possible way you'll reach this boss and have no way of killing it? FINALLY! Eventually he collapses, and Zelda uses her magic to contain him, which allows Link to deliver the final blow. That is immensely satisfying. With Ganon defeated, the sages open up the portal to the Sacred Realm, and Ganondorf is sealed away. Zelda thanks Link for his help, and apologizes for roping him into all this. She tells him he must return to his own time and lay the Master Sword to rest, meaning they won't see each other again in this form. Zelda then uses the Ocarina of Time to send Link back so he can regain his lost childhood. Much like Link to the Past, we get a really fun credit sequence that goes through all the locations in the game. We see everyone celebrating the defeat of Ganondorf, and all of them are here. Malin, Bigaron, the Cuckoo Lady, Mido, and King Zora. I love this image. Even the sages come by to celebrate. That's cool. Afterwards, we see Link in the Temple of Time, and the Master Sword is back in its pedestal where it belongs. With their journey complete, Navi bids farewell to Link and flies off. We see Link and Zelda reunite in the Garden of the Castle, bringing this epic and magical adventure to an end. So, after... All of that. Is Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time worthy of its praise, or is it highly overrated? Yes. Is this game perfect? No, absolutely not. Hyrule Field is way too big and empty, some of the bosses can be annoying, and there are multiple plot points that go nowhere. But it is still an amazing game. It converted the series into 3D really well, the combat is immensely satisfying, the puzzles are really clever and creative, and the story, though basic, is one of the most compelling things in any video game up to that point. I can see why people got sick of this game after it was put on such a high pedestal for so long, but let's face it, anything put on that high a pedestal is gonna get hate. This is still a game that I absolutely love, and it is the earliest Zelda game that I can highly recommend to anyone. It's not perfect, but it's still incredible. Whether it's the original version or the remaster, play this. Trust me. And Orange Ocean has... Meta Knight. Once you beat him and recover all the Star Rod pieces, Kirby heads to the Fountain of Dreams to return it, but DDD begs him not to. Kirby ignores his warnings and puts it back. And then this happens. Turns out this evil monster known as Nightmare attempted to steal the Star Rod to turn Dreamland into a world of terror, and DDD was trying to stop him this whole time. Oops. Kirby's Adventure is a vast improvement over Kirby's Dreamland. It's still really easy, but there's a lot of charm to it. If you're looking to get into the Kirby series, I think this is a great place to start. Either that or the remake, which is probably better, but the original version is available on more platforms. I just wish Kirby was here right now to help me fend off the nightmares I've been having lately. I still see it when I close my eyes. Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. Recently I was talking to this guy who tried to kill me a few years ago, and he said he needed my help to build a bomb so he could stop an earthquake. Obviously I should trust him, right? Crash Bandicoot 2. Cortex Strikes Back. Spoilers. They also switched out Crash's girlfriend, Tana, for a sister named Coco, since Sony Computer Entertainment Japan apparently felt uncomfortable with a quote-unquote super sexy character alongside Crash. Uh, this is Japan we're talking about, right? Where did Coco come from, and how are they related if Crash was one of two bandicoots created by Cortex? Well, I can answer that question with the same answer I give to what happened to Tana. I don't know. The first game had a couple of levels where you ride a pig, but here you can ride Puller the Puller Bear, which is basically the same thing, only he controls much better, can speed up, and he's absolutely adorable. Aww, look at the little guy. I'm sorry I have to do this to you, buddy, but I need those extra lives. But it's all worth it, because this game introduced us to the sheer majesty that is the Crash Dance, which he does every time you get a gem. The Insane Trilogy changed it a bit by making these pelvic thrusts more of a shuffle, but regardless, the dance is absolutely delightful every time you see it. 
All right, fine. There, I did the dance. You happy? Crash Dash, our first chase level where you run from a giant boulder. This reminds me of a movie or something. What was it called again? Oh, right, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Up next is Cold Hard Crash. <laughs> this is the worst level in the whole fucking game. It is miserable. It's another ice level with a death route platform that is complete bullshit. You have to slide on ice through crushing pillars and nitro boxes that are so fucking hard to avoid, hit this metal box, then go all the way back to break this one apple that reappears, and then carry on with the rest of the level. Not only do these require fucking pinpoint precision on these god god awful ice physics, it is nearly impossible to get through these without invincibility, but if you go too far and fall off the edge, you need to die and go back. And there's no checkpoint in here. You have to do it all in one go. I spent half an hour on this <laughs> level, and it was horrible. Not to mention, this level likes to hide boxes, and let me tell you, there is nothing worse than going through this miserable gauntlet, only to reach the end and find out you missed- uh... Crash Bandicoot 2 is a vast improvement over the first game. It has more abilities, better levels, and it's just overall way more fun to play. The backtracking can get pretty annoying, especially when going for 100% completion, but other than that, it is a high recommendation. I just really wish they fixed the ice physics in the Insane Trilogy, because I could say with absolute confidence that there is no way ice physics work like that in real life. <laughs> See? Totally different. Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. Merry Christmas. Hard to believe it's back already. I don't really have many plans this year, so I figured I'd just check them out. Dear esteemed guest, you are officially invited to the first annual Christmas party. Tonight only, please arrive at the house next to the hospital on Guerrero Street. Hmm, sounds big, and hey, I haven't met my party quarter for this year, let's do it! Well, this is the place. Ah, oh, Aiden, you made it! Zev, what are you doing here? I thought you lived on East Street. Yeah, I had to move out too many ghosts. So, is this an outdoor thing, or are you gonna let me in? Yeah, freezing to death isn't on the list, but we can do it if you want. Yeah, I'd rather go inside. You're the second guest who's arrived. This is my new neighbor, Dr. Stelloscope. Hi. So, is this everyone? Nope, we have one more guest coming. No, I told you to stop selling to that store. They refused our last shipment. Oh, no, 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 no! Ah, uh, yes, Lawrence Clark, CEO of the Bread Company. How you doing? Why is he here? I assume it's because of the Postal Service. I'm not partying with him. Why? What did I do? You broke into my house. And you sold me faulty bread and then sent me a terrible game which caused me to wake up in a dollar tree. Consider us even. Guys, guys, no fighting on Christmas. This is not Thanksgiving. All right, fine but I won't like it. So, what activities do you have planned? Well, there's the classic standing around and doing nothing. Looks like we've done that, let's move to sitting. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. That's all you have planned? Well, I tried to plan more, but I kept falling asleep. You should get that looked at. There's a hospital next door. Aren't you a doctor? Legally, no. Spiritually, also no. Metaphorically, yes. Well, does anyone else have any ideas? We could go outside and freeze. Nah, I'm trying to avoid that. We could talk politics. But we already agreed on everything. Ah, don't worry, I know a great way to pass the time. Nothing says Christmas party like living it up playing some Club Penguin for the DS. You brought that with you? Of course, never leave home without it. Why would we do that? Well, just let me explain. But the game also ended up getting a collector's edition released in 2009, which came with a special stylus that I still own. You brought that too? So why would we play the DS game? Because it's Christmas, and this was one of the most prolific Christmas presents I ever got. This was my first ever DS game. I don't know. Sounds kind of dull. Ah, come on, this is a great game. Just give it a chance. Well, if you insist. I can confirm. I do. And now we can start the game. You can either continue on your main file or play as a guest, meaning it doesn't save your progress. This is nice since you can replay the game without deleting your save file, but it means you would have to beat the entire thing in one sitting. Dang it! But let me tell you, they did not need to go this hard with the music. This game has a genuinely amazing soundtrack. Every song in here was either a wholly original or a new version of a song from the web game, and they are all great and really varied too. You've got the nice and cozy town theme, the sweet and majestic beach music, the highly soothing lodge music, the killer nightclub song, and easily the best one of all, the dojo theme. I mean, talk about a major upgrade from before.
flashlight, which lights up dark areas, and it's only used twice in the entire game, and two more that I have to save for later. Why? Because. Well, I'm unimpressed. How? It feels way too basic. We need more action going on. I mean, I just don't like it because, ugh, birds. And while we're criticizing, where are all the Christmas decorations? Yeah, for a Christmas party, this feels a lot more like Memorial Day. Sorry, all the stores were closed. Not all of them. There was a store open that I saw on the way here. They're bound to have some great Christmas decorations. I swear it looked different in the brochure. You can even upload your coins to clubpenguin.com and never mind. Yeah, still not interested. Yeah, if I wanted to have boring conversations with people I don't like, I would have gone back home to my aunt's house. Well, does anyone have any other ideas? We can go on Omegle. Oh, never mind. All right, if the missions aren't interesting to you, uh, maybe the minigames can save it. I'm listening. You know, I'm impressed. Really? Yeah. It's even more lame now. Ugh, what is it with you guys? It's like you're not even trying to enjoy yourselves. Look, dude, I've been busting my ass to get this party off the ground, and now you want to play a game based off a dead website? Yeah, the hospital's crazy this time of year, so I'm not exactly looking to try new things. But that's what the holidays are all about. You know what? How about we look at the actual missions, you know? Get more of a feel for the story. Nah. Well, screw you, I'm gonna do it anyway. PH decides to kill two birds with one stone, bad choice of analogy there, by having you train with Flair. Looking around, we discover some weird blueprints and a map to a different part of the mine. All signs point to him being there, so we leave a note for him and the other agents. So, now we're off to the mine to find Gary. Uh, wait, where did everyone go? Oh, I'm sorry, was I boring you back there? Yes. Well, gee, thanks, you invite me to a party and all you guys do is ignore me. Well, excuse us for not wanting to hear you blabber about some old DS game. I thought it would be a fun way to celebrate the holidays, but this is just putting more stress on me. I don't even like you. If I wasn't tricked, I wouldn't have come. You know what? That's it! I've had enough. If you guys don't want me here, then maybe I should just go. Fine with me. Me too. Yeah. Uh, was kinda hoping for a different response. I think you've said enough. Okay, uh, maybe I can make it up to you guys. Uh, do you want one of my copies of Wii Music? How about two? Three? Maybe six. Just go. <sighs> Remember to lock the door on your way out. I most certainly will not. So who's gonna lock it? <sighs> what do I care? I don't need them. I can just sit here and talk about the game by myself. Like I always do. Alone. We then return to the dojo for our final puffle test, which requires all seven of them. Pop lifts the weight, Blast destroys the pinata, Loop lassos the toy to get the key, Chirp breaks the snow globe, Flare melts the ice, Bouncer cools off the chest, open the chest with the key, and Flit grabs the diploma, meaning your puffle training is officially complete. See, what was I worried about? I don't need him. So, how's the holiday season been? Well, have you ever tried to run a bread company during Christmas? Not a fun time. It can be worse than being a doctor. Everyone has seen extended families, and you have no idea how many injuries it causes. I'd take injured kids over complaining adults any day. People are way too picky about the quality of their loaves and baguettes. At least you guys didn't have to move during winter. You know, I'm really not liking your attitude. Yeah, I was fine when the anger was directed at other people, but now that it's directed at me, I'm very angry. You know, I am the richest one here, and I'm the one with the weapon, so I kind of feel like that puts me in power here. Hey guys, don't you agree? Hey, why don't you listen to me? I have weapons, weapons, weapons! Before going on, I should probably discuss the side missions. They're all really simple. Oh, well, it must be nice to get people things for Christmas. <sighs> Whatever. What was that? Hello, Mr. Aiden. Who's there? My name is Harold Henderson and I'm here to serve as a spirit guide. Wait a minute, you're a game show host, a real estate agent, and you're a spirit guide? I don't pry into your personal life while you're prying into mine. You know what, that's a fair point. Anyways, you need to get back to the party. Oh, forget it. Listen, the holidays are a stressful time for everybody, but that doesn't mean you should be rude to people. This time of year is supposed to be about bringing people in, not shooing them away. You know what, you're right. Maybe I was a bit hard on them. Thanks, Harold. No problem. And so sorry I couldn't be there in person. I'm on my way to my next shift at Burger King. How many jobs do you have? Enough to get by. Good luck. Mm. 
I can cut all of your breath supplies off for a year. I brought the red company and I'd like to also draw your attention to my weapon. Do you guys have any idea how hard it is to have ghosts in your house before you move? Do you have any idea how angry people get when their nephew puts marbles up a kid's nose? Well, I almost got sued this year, Miss Marble, and I am a CEO! I can't deal with that. I had to bring in not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six extra lawyers to win! You know what? I'm starting to think this whole party was a mistake. Me, Me too. too! What are we doing? It's Christmas and we spent the whole time yelling at each other. Well, we've all been stressed out. I think it just went a little too far. Yeah, maybe we were a bit hard on, um, Oh God, what's his name? I mean, if nothing else, he gave us something to talk about. Even if it was something we couldn't care less about. And I'll admit, those insults were pretty entertaining. <laughs> Where have you been? Just at the end of the block. Your neighbors really need better fences for their dogs. So that's why so many patients had dog bites. Guys. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have snapped at you like that. The holidays are all about being together with people, not forcing everyone to do something that you want to do. <sighs> it wasn't right for me to make you play that game that you didn't care about. Well, we're sorry too. Really? You just wanted to talk to us about something you're really passionate about. It's not your fault that we didn't care. Yeah, if it makes you feel better, I didn't really have any plans for this party anyway. Plus, making fun of you was a great way to pass the time. Thanks, guys. You know, I do have a few more missions left to beat. What do you say we finish them together? It turns out he designed a bunch of test robots to help with his experiments, but they ended up going haywire and ran off. He made the robo-locator to track them, but he lost it when he crashed in the mine, along with his notebook. So, yeah, it turns out cheese robots have been the one causing trouble this whole time. I knew you could never trust. Machinery. Use the device to disable him and put both robots in bubbles. With that, the robots have been taken care of and you're promoted again. So, now what? Well, the director said there's a play being held in our honor, so let's go to the stage. Use the flashlight for the second time all game and find Dot, Rookie, PH, and Jetpack Guy throwing you a surprise party as a way of thanking you for stopping the robots. We then get this really cute credit sequence and... What the fu- Yep, we're not done yet. Mission 13, an agent's work is never done. It attacks the nightclub to steal the turntable, and wow, that 3D model sticks out like a sore thumb. You sneak up onto the gift shop roof and use the macro duster to make it sneeze, which freeze blast. And from this point on, the final mission is really easy. Just follow the ultimate protobot and use whichever puffle you just saved to hit him. Lame. Yeah, it's pretty disappointing. And that's the end of the game. What'd you think? Meh. Nah. Well, regardless, I'm glad we got to spend it together. Well, it's been fun, but I should probably get going. Yeah, me too. Someone's gotta sell bread on Christmas. <laughs> Aw, but we were just getting to the good part. Well, you know what they say, all's well that ends well. Sure, why not? You know what? Thanks, guys. Merry Christmas. Wait a minute, this is my house. And there we have another successful Christmas, even if it didn't quite go as planned. The holidays can be a very stressful time, but that doesn't mean you should forget what's really important. Merry Christmas, everybody. It, it, huh, would you look at that? A present. <sighs> Boy, I sure can't wait to see what I got this year. You know, maybe freezing to death isn't such a bad thing. Hello, human beings, Power Yammer here. Lately, I've been having trouble deciding what I want to do with myself, so I figured I'd let someone else decide for me. That's right, I now officially have a narrator. Aiden got up from his chair. Aiden walked down the street. Aiden robbed the bank. Aiden destroyed his intestinal tract. Aiden walked into busy traffic. Aiden played Bubsy. <laughs>
Okay, maybe narrators don't always know best. I guess I should have learned from the Stanley parable. This is the story of a man named Stanley. Hey, recapping the story is my job. The game follows a man named Stanley. But if you really want to see just how much this takes the piss out of other video games, just look at the achievements. There's the jumping one I already mentioned, a test achievement you can't actually get, playing the game for the entire duration of a Tuesday, oddly specific, and the original even had the go outside achievement where you had to go five years without playing the game. But that was removed in the Ultra Deluxe version, and instead we have what? TEN YEARS?! I HAVE TO WAIT TEN YEARS TO GET THIS ACHIEVEMENT?! ARE YOU MAD?! The first one I was able to get by walking through this red door. Doing this leads you to a room full of sparkles. The narrator goes on about how they make you happy, and, um, yeah, he's right. These do make me happy. They're just so... peaceful. It's like all the problems in the world don't exist anymore. And it's all thanks to these wonderful- Ooh, what's in the door? Oh, ah, it's just some stairs. The narrator warns you that you could die by falling off of them. Yeah, I should probably listen to him. Back to the sparkles. Wow, it's even better the second time. This makes the northern lights look like a desk lamp. It's just so... magical. Yeah, I'm bored now. Back to the stairs. No. Now he warned me if I die, I'll reset the game, so I just won't die. Geronimo! Oh. See, I knew I'd oh. live. Let's do it again. As you keep jumping, the narrator just gets sadder and sadder, and look, buddy, I think I've gotten all the value I can from some colors. Leap of faith, baby! Is it over? It's going to restart, isn't it? I'm going back. Well, that was a great way to start. Next up, I decided to go into my boss's office, and the narrator got fed up with me typing in the wrong key code. I'm bad with calculus. And here's this dark little room. I guess there's nothing else to do other than shut the game off. Wait, 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 why am I back here? But listen to me. You can still save those two. Well then tell me! Come on, come on, come on, I'm running out of time, and... dead. Why did my first two choices kill me? Well, going upstairs didn't go so well, so this time I'm gonna go downstairs. This results in Stanley being trapped in an infinite loop of rooms as the narrator tries to force him to go insane and make us think we're in a dream. Yeah, I've seen that plot twist a million times, buddy, and this ain't a dream. If it was, my teeth would be falling out and I'd be speaking with old classmates in my grandma's house. Eventually, we cut to a woman named Mariella, who finds Stanley passed out in the middle of the sidewalk before carrying on with her day. Typical life in New York City. Three innings in, and we've died twice and gone insane. That's a new personal best for me. Eventually, he gets fed up, and as you follow the adventure line, which twists all over the place, and even add some music to lighten the mood. But the line eventually leads us right back to the monitor room. I knew lines couldn't be trusted. The narrator gets angry and resets the game again, this time deciding you should forge your own story together. Yeah, even the narrator has no idea what's going on with this ending, and he's basically a friend just trying to figure it all out with you. It's priceless. You even run into the line again, and eventually wind up in this room that classifies this as the confusion ending, revealing that all of this was supposed to happen, and we're supposed to restart four more times. Again, the narrator didn't make any of this, and if he wrote the story, who the hell did decide all this? What's going on here, are we? Are we all just secretly play things for some higher beings doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over again as we travel through life having no idea what'll happen? Well, that was a lot to unpack, so I think I'll just do what the narrator actually tells me to do. Here you discover that everything in the office is under constant supervision, and they are controlling your every move. This is why I never went to college. The narrator gets fed up, so he sends you back, but also gives you a third option. It doesn't matter which one you take, they're all the same. He then asks for your feedback on if that option improved the game. Oh, of course. A three. Really. Some people just can't handle critique. He then adds a leaderboard, and when you give feedback on that, he asks you to test a prototype of his new game. A cardboard baby will crawl towards fire, and you have to push this button to send it back. Thrilling! He says the meaning doesn't become clear until four hours in, so we're in this for the long run. Okay, I'm bored. You heartless bastard. We have some fun, and he leaves us for dead. Ah, uh, just like Monopoly night at Grandma's house. <laughs> I'm just messing with ya. We did not have fun. I now bring you the absolute best moment in the game, and what might be one of the greatest things in video game history. After going left and passing through the meeting room, you can open the door to... The Broom Closet. Stanley stepped into the broom closet, but there was nothing here, so he turned around and got back on track. You can seriously just sit in here, and the narrator will continuously ramble about how baffling it is that you are just standing in the broom closet. Maybe to you this is somehow its own branching path. Maybe when you go talk about this with your friend, you'll say, Oh, did you get the broom closet ending? The broom closet ending was my favorite. I hope your friends find this concerning. Eventually, he assumes you've died and asks someone else to come take your place. Well, I've come to a very definite conclusion about what's going on right now. You're dead. 
You got to this broom closet, explored it a bit, and were just about to leave because there's nothing here when a physical melody of some This goes on for a good five minutes, and it's the funniest part of the entire game. Eventually he does run out of things to say, but if you go back after a reset, he'll get angry again, and then after another reset, he'll just board up the door so he can't go in again. That is incredible. By simply remaining here, Stanley is slowly dying as he has no true purpose in this world and is effectively wasting his life away. Hello, this is the writers of the Stanley Parable. I didn't give you permission to write my biography. Yeah, that depressed me, so we're going back to the cargo platform. You get slightly different dialogue if you step on it, step off before it leaves, and then jump just for the hell of it. I'm going back to the basement. Don't waste your time with these buttons, they do absolutely nothing. I should now reach the power source and hit the on button instead of off. This initiates a self-destruct sequence which leads to an impending countdown. You scramble to escape as the narrator laughs at your suffering before the thing goes boom. And you call me a heartless bastard. All I did was kill a baby, I didn't laugh about it. Back to the platform, and instead of answering the phone, I unplug it. The narrator is baffled at my decision, and he comes to the conclusion that I'm not Stanley. You're realizing this now. And now we reach the absolute worst ending in this game, the art ending. Remember when I said the baby game doesn't get good until four hours in? Yeah, that wasn't a joke. You actually have to play this game for four hours! Okay, I get the gag, but seriously, who thought this was a good idea? This is literally just a colossal waste of time! But it gets worse, because two hours in, this puppy starts being lowered into piranhas, and you have to push a second button to prevent that. If either of these things fail, you have to start all over again! Granted, this isn't hard, and you have plenty of time, but that feeling of being able to fail and having to spend another two to four hours to try again is terrifying just knowing that it's possible. A slight mistake makes my heart pound out of fear that I've wasted all my time. Wait a minute. I get it now. That's the idea! The process of doing this shows how difficult life can be and failure can lead to devastation. Failing to protect the baby and puppy feels horrible, just like it would in real life! It's brilliant! It's incredible! It shows the fragile nature of the human spirit and gives us empathy for these digital slabs of cardboard! And after pushing these buttons for four hours, you learn that when you die, you will be salvaged by this art god and spend eternity performing improv comedy. Never mind, this was a horrible decision. Well, that's four hours of my life I'm not getting back, but this is the deluxe version, so we have some new endings as well. Going through the new content door takes you on a small ride, and after this elevator, you come across <gasps> the jump circle. Could it be? Could it actually be? You only have a small amount of jumps, but I don't care! This is incredible! This alone makes the Ultra Deluxe version worth it! You get in another elevator, and, uh, that's it. Well, I'm satisfied, but the narrator isn't. He creates a giant display center for you to explore, and there's all kinds of stuff. Balloons for the office, figures to collect, a button that says Jim, an emotional support bucket, and best of all, the infinite hole, which you can hop right in. Don't worry, you can teleport back out at any time, so I'm going again! Yahoo! Wait, what? That... That's a bottom! You lied to me! Well, fine, just to spite you, I'm going again. And again. Yeah, the thing keeps getting smaller and smaller, and eventually it's basically nothing. You can't teleport out, so he just leaves you, but then it starts lowering itself. And you get the ability to- Oh my god, you can actually see Stanley! So that's his face! Instead of the adventure line, this elevator leads to an intervention from characters of the last game who think Stanley is too attached to the bucket. I don't know what would give them that idea. So you follow the line again and reach a bucket destroyer. The narrator tells you to murder the bucket, but this ain't the companion cube from Portal, so I don't. Worth it. Answering the phone has Stanley start a new life with the bucket as he takes it home and back to work with him. Looks like things get a little spicy here. Coming soon to a theater near you. And going out the window, the bucket goes into its backstory, which results in Stanley killing it. At this point, I'm convinced the bucket is the real villain in this game. Aiden forgets the insane ending. I thought I shot you! Well, he is right. The only thing different is that Stanley is upset about losing his bucket, and Mariella has her own. That's all the endings the bucket changes, but it does have one more that's completely original. If you try to get to the red and blue doors, you'll be greeted by the sign that says no buckets allowed. The narrator is concerned you don't know what a bucket is or isn't, so now we're on a game show. Is this a bucket? I'm gonna say yes. Incorrect. Dang it. This one, I'm going no. Correct. Yeah, I knew it! Well, this can't be a bucket. Incorrect. Oh, come on. Alright, that one's definitely a bucket. Are you hallucinating? This is a tractor. It's an enormous machine that tills the earth. I thought this was a gimmick. How on earth did you manage to screw it up? Absolutely incredible. Then what have I been Just keeping my sand in? Oh, bucket. nope, I see it. That has got to be a bucket. Correct. Yep, I'm yes. mistaken. Alright, I got this. Yes, There's no way that's a bucket. Trick question. Both. Gotcha. I have 
So many questions. Nothing there. Oh no, I'm not falling for that again. Okay, you and I both know there isn't anything here. And I don't appreciate the implication that nothing is a bucket when we both clearly know that a bucket is something. And therefore nothing could possibly be something. You know what? I'm too confused to even sort it out. I've lost all sense of perspective. What is a bucket? What isn't a bucket? Mere moments ago I could answer these questions with confidence. May I suggest making a flowchart? Am I a bucket? I know I'm not. He then erases all buckets from the game, which deletes everything. I knew it. The Stanley Parable is delightful. This is an idea that can only work as a video game, and it does it pretty much perfectly. The gameplay itself is nothing spectacular, but the writing and humor are absolutely hilarious. I definitely recommend playing it if you're curious. But I will admit, once you're done, there's not much of a reason to go back to it. Once you've seen everything the game has to offer, it doesn't really have as much value as it did before. I definitely had a good time with this game, but I don't know if I'm going to play it again. Which, now that I think about it, isn't such a bad thing if it means I'm going to get that achievement. And you know what? Maybe they're right. I'm not just going to go outside. I'm going to super go outside. Well, this sucks. I'm going to go somewhere more fun instead. Are you... are you really still in the broom closet? Standing around doing nothing? Why? Please offer me some explanation here, I'm... I'm genuinely confused. America is in shambles, and who do you trust to fix it? Well guess what? We've tried those types of people, and they failed us. So we need someone who won't fail. And there's no one I trust more than Jerry the Rock. Jerry is a hard-working soul. He always looks out for the little guys. And he is immune to corruption, for his spirit is rock solid. This country needs help, and Jerry will make it rock. Jerry the Rock for President. Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. Election years are always stressful, but it's good to know we have an actually good candidate running this year. There's been a lot of great presidents over the years, and a lot of bad ones. You've got William Harrison, who died a month in, or Abraham Lincoln, who put the country back together. You know something's truly great when it changes history forever, just like Super Mario 64 when it released in 1996, or Albert Einstein when he invented the light bulb. What do you mean that wasn't him? There's a sunken pirate ship, some clams, and of course a giant eel that is one of the many reasons 90s kids are afraid of the ocean now. We also have a giant snowman and this mother penguin that lost her baby. I think we all know what to do here. Also, apparently the boos in this game were inspired by Takashi Tezuka's wife and how she exploded in anger at him at one point. I don't know if this is true, but I find it too hilarious to not mention. Snowman's Land, did we really need two snow levels? Well, this one's less vertical than Cool Cool Mountain, but there's an ice lake that hurts you, an ice bully that's the same as the ones in Lethal Lava Land, a giant snowman that'll blow you away, and even an igloo, which is miserable to get to. And entering it is the only time in the game you need to crawl. Well, it's still accomplished more than William Harrison, but the few of you that actually like doing math probably realize that 15 courses with 7 stars each gives us 105 power stars, and if there's 120 total, that leaves 15 extra stars unaccounted for. Well, that's where Peach's Castle comes into play. I think I'm gonna save that for another time, because playing this monumental game has inspired me to leave my mark in a very similar way. That's right, I am going to change the world by becoming the first man to get up breathing! <gasps> Oh my kidding, I can't do it, it just feels too good! Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. The increase in the prices of flowers, chocolates, and therapists tells me that it's Valentine's Day, alright. The one holiday that can make Christmas think capitalism has gone too far. I don't have any plans, I mean I haven't gotten any matches on Tinder lately. Don't know why, my profile is a gold mine. So I think I'll play a game to pass the time, and there's never been a greater story of true love than a brave knight venturing forth to rescue a princess. I mean, it's superficial, but hey, it works. And we can't do the typical Mario or Zelda, no, 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 those games have other stuff going on. We need something that is all about saving the princess. And after a lot of searching, I think I finally found just the game. But dang it, this always happens. <sighs> well, I guess we'll just go with Dragon's Lair instead. Dragon's Lair, a giant money snatcher that lies somewhere in between slot machines and OnlyFans. Dragon's Lair is stupidly hard, and I would say it's not worth playing... But honestly, dying is half the fun of this game. Almost every hazard in this game has a unique death animation to it, and seeing all the different ways you can die combined with Dark's cowardly screams is legitimately hilarious. Most of them involve him just falling, but he also gets eaten, burned, tied up, shocked, decapitated, bashed in the head, crushed, slammed into a wall, and wait, did I just say decapitated? Nice. All right, this is the last one. Just don't screw it up. Yeah, I did it! And here's the final level. You just need to... Okay, I screwed that up. Let's try that again. Ah, crap. You know what, that took 10 minutes to get through, so uh, let's just consider the final level a checkpoint. Cool? Cool.
Anyways, the final level is inside the dragon's chamber. Grab these things so he doesn't wake up, but he wakes up anyway. Avoid his fire, then grab more of them. Why does he have these? Then Daphne talks to you, and you say she was inspired by Playboy models, eh? Please save me! The cage is locked with a key. The dragon keeps it around his neck. I'm sure this made many kids confused. Dragon's Lair is an impressive piece of technology, but it's not a very good video game. If you enjoy failing over and over, I guess I can recommend it, but if you just want to look at the pretty animation, you're better off just watching a playthrough of it on YouTube. And it's a shame the romance aspect wasn't actually that prevalent, because now it looks like I wasted another Valentine's Day. Wait a minute. If it's almost over, then that means... All of the store's chocolate will be on clearance! I gotta go! And they were all sold out. <sighs> they did offer me some other stuff from the clearance bin, but I don't think I can wear those in public. Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. You ever hear that joke about the hedgehog that tried to go 3D? Yeah, well, you shouldn't joke about that. It's a very serious issue. It was highly acclaimed upon its release, with many people considering it a true step forward for the series, but nowadays reception has become a lot more divisive. This game has a lot of fans, but it also has a lot of haters. This was definitely a turning point for the Sonic series, as the franchise went from being on top of the world to something no one can really agree on. But if you've been active on the internet for the last decade, you know all this by now. Saying Sonic struggled to go 3D has become such an overused phrase they make t-shirts out of it at this point. But either way, the game was a commercial hit. It is the best-selling Dreamcast game ever, with a whopping 2.5 million copies. Yeah, despite having some great titles, the Dreamcast was an overall failure, and as a result, Sega ended up becoming a third-party company. Sonic starts out running through a large city known as Station Square, when suddenly it's attacked by this weird water monster known as Chaos. No, not that one. Not that one either. <sighs> Alright, let's get this over with. Big is by far the most hated part of this entire game, and I can safely say he lives up to the hype. But if you're thinking that sounds absolutely horrible for a platformer, don't worry, because Big's levels aren't about platforming, they're about fishing! Yeah, fishing, in a Sonic the Hedgehog game. This is not fun at all, and isn't what you would want in a Sonic game. I seriously have no idea why this is here, but I really want to see how they came up with it. Alright team, we're gonna need some new playable characters for Sonic's big 3D debut. Anyone have any ideas? Hmm, how about a fat purple cat that's an idiot? Hmm, that could work, but what would his gameplay be? Yeah, this weekend I'm going fishing. That's perfect! Yeah, this isn't combining pinball and platforming like Casino Night Zone from Sonic 2, it's just straight up pinball. Which is fine by me, I love a good pinball game. Depending on which one you enter, you can get these cards or spin these slot wheels. And the card one is inspired by another game made by Sonic Team called Nights Into Dreams, which is really cool. And apparently they were going to use that game's engine to model Sonic Extreme, but Yuji Naka wouldn't let them, hence partially why the game was cancelled. Lovely! They land in Station Square and find Eggman nearby. He vows to still destroy the city and fires a missile that ends up not exploding. Remind we have this guy's a genius again? We see Tikal pleading with her father to not invade other villages, but he claims it's for the, the greater good. He goes outside, finds Eggman and Chaos, Froggy spits out the emerald, and gets absorbed into Chaos thanks to his tail. So now Big has to fight Chaos X by casting his line to fish out Froggy and really- That's it? Beta does go down, but before exploding, he manages to hit Gamma with one last shot. Gamma sees a small bird fly away in peace as he succumbs to his injuries and is destroyed. Sonic Adventure is a mixed bag. I can understand why it's so divisive nowadays, because literally every single character has a different level of quality to them. Sonic is great, Knuckles is really good, Tails is decent, Gamma's okay, Amy's meh, and Big is awful. But thankfully, the best character has the most amount of levels, and the two worst characters have the fewest. Overall, I'd say I enjoyed my time with Sonic Adventure, and I'd recommend playing it if you're interested. And now enough time has passed, so that it is finally acceptable to make those jokes. If you'll excuse me, I have an open mic night to get to. Hell, human beings, power over here. Right now I'm on a mission to prove to the world that there is indeed a game called Mega Man 5, because, I mean, there has to. Why would they go straight from 4 to 7? That doesn't make any sense. Mega Man 5, The Forgotten Child. If you thought Mega Man 4 was barely talked about, wait till you hear about Mega Man 5. You see, that's a trick question, because you never hear about Mega Man 5. And now as for the actual game... It's a Mega Man game, alright! Gyro Man has the obligatory sky level with falling platforms and... chickens? Oh no... Okay, they're easy to deal with, thank god. But they fully restore both your health and all of your weapons ammo, so they are super useful to find, but not very fun to use because of this.
Once you beat him, you find out that this whole thing was orchestrated by Dr. Wily. Wow, I never would have guessed. Wily dares Mega Man to come to his lab and save Dr. Light, and you know what that means? Okay, I am really starting to question where these fortresses are coming from. Mega Man 5 is honestly a really fun game. Admittedly, it doesn't do that much different than the previous Mega Man games, and it can be seen as an underwhelming entry, but in terms of the overall experience, I think this game might be about on par with 2. The levels are fun, the weapons are cool, and it controls really well. Aside from the ending being a little frustrating, I really enjoyed playing Mega Man 5. But if it's actually fun to play, why does everyone forget about it? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. It's because buying a physical copy costs more than my left foot. Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. It's finally squid hunting season, so I'm gonna take out those slimy cephalopods using the one thing they fear most. Paint! Hmm. Turns out squids are tougher to find in this area than I thought. So, if I can't hunt for sport, I will hunt for honor. Splatoon, the only cultural impact left by the Wii U. Yeah, it's safe to say that this console didn't do so well, and that's being generous, so it was surprising that Nintendo put so much focus into a brand new IP, and said brand new IP was one of the best-selling games on the system. But I guess they figured they had nothing to lose at that point. Like many people, I never had a Wii U growing up, so I missed out on Splatoon initially, but I saw commercials for it and thought it looked like a lot of fun, so I did snag the two sequels when they came out, and I really enjoyed them. And with the Wii U's online server shutting down soon, I figured it's now or never when it comes to playing the original. So, I did the unthinkable and proved to the world that I am not a person who will make wise financial decisions. I bought a Wii U in 2024. After a brief tutorial section, you arrive in the town of Inkopolis, where you see a news broadcast from Callie and Mary, very clever, two pop stars known as the Squid Sisters, who are also news reporters for some reason. It's not often you see celebrities being a part of the media instead of being harassed by it. Throughout the story mode, you can collect these scrolls that give you information on the history of the Inklings, and learn that they're actually humans that evolved from squids over thousands of years after the humanity we know went extinct, and they've apparently been at war with the Octarians for centuries. This is a kid's game, right? You'll be covering these locations from head to toe in orange juice, toothpaste, grape soda, Pepto-Bismol, lime snot, and blueberry jam. I would say paint the town red, but surprisingly, cherry cola is not one of the colors. Can't possibly imagine why. The only downside is there has to be eight players or else the match doesn't start, so you can sit there for three minutes and for some reason you don't get that one last player you need, meaning you completely wasted your time. Well, except for this match where there were only six people, but it started anyway, and instead of three on each team, it did four on one and two on the other. Guess which one I was on. Splatoon is a lot of fun, but there's not much of a reason to play it anymore. Almost everything about it is there and improved upon in its two sequels, and with the online multiplayer shutting down soon, all that's going to be left is the single player, which is still solid, but you're not going to get much time out of it. Granted, I got my copy for only like 10 bucks, so it's not a worthless addition to your collection, but it's not mandatory either, especially if you don't already own a Wii U. I mean, why would you buy the worst-selling Nintendo console ever just to play a game that's going to lose its main appeal in like a week? Wait a minute. Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. If you want to take something that's already good and make it into something equally good, but also wildly different, you gotta make sure you do it right. Uh, a random example, turning a platforming game into a role-playing game is a lot simpler than turning a porcupine into a pincushion. I'm still finding needles. Everywhere. Mario goes home, and Toad encourages him to go to the Mushroom Kingdom to warn the Chancellor. He does so, and after a hilarious reenactment, the Chancellor tells him to go find Peach. But if you want, you can do some snooping around and find... This took me ages to beat when I first played this game, and it's the only time I had to grind on my first playthrough because I was unaware of the best strategy. Spam Mallow's lightning and he goes down in just a few minutes. I was quite stupid. You then head to the forest maze, which easily has my favorite music in the game. It's just so bouncy and happy and instantly puts you in a good mood. Outside, Bowser is messing around trying to get in, and he sees Mario. He then decides to, ahem, <laughs> let Mario and friends join his minions, and then he joins the party. Sweet! We head inside and find Booster as this weird clown guy, and he's apparently going to marry Peach. I'm sure Bowser's taking notes. After that, Booster reveals he didn't actually care about the marriage. He just wanted to throw a party and eat the cake. Funny, a cousin of mine said the exact same thing. He asks Mario and friends to find the star pieces, and Peach offers to tag along, but the Chancellor won't let her. She claims she can take care of herself. I find that hard to believe. But he still says no. You need to touch these things to open up these giant star doors, and along the way we can even find some of the wishes, which clearly belong to some of the NPCs in the game. We also find a wish from Mallow, his real parents, and even... 
Aww. We land in Barrel Volcano, which is just a bunch of lava and rock enemies. <laughs> in the end, you fight the Czar Dragon, which is just a blar from Super Mario World that spits fire at you. And it has two phases after it burns in lava and becomes a skeleton, while Bowser furiously takes notes once again. Then you fight this knight named Boomer on the chandeliers from the beginning of the game. He's really easy, but after you beat him, he decides to die with honor by making the chandelier fall, and then you ascend as everyone dances. Someone just died! But despite those issues, this is still a pretty fun game. The combat is overall solid, and the comedic writing and fun characters are enough to make you want to see it through to the end. Plus, by RPG standards, it's really short. It only takes like 10 hours to go through. So if you have a Switch, pick it up and see what it's all about. It'll also give you some great advice, like how you shouldn't marry someone just for a cake. Because believe me, that is one court settlement you're never gonna win. Trust me, I've seen it. Hello, human beings, Power Hammer here. That awkward moment when you're replaying a game you loved so much as a kid and you think it doesn't hold up too well at first, but then you realize you're not actually playing Lego Batman, you're just digging a hole. Why does this keep happening to me? The Batcave is pretty small, but it does have some fun things you can do, like collecting extra studs, the suits, as previously mentioned, and beating up Alfred. I love it when he goes flying. The penguin runs into the sewers with Killer Croc, and Robin gets decapitated. God, I love kids' games with a morbid sense of humor. We go to Arkham, and I feel like we've forgotten something. Oh right, Bane! Yeah, you don't actually fight Bane. He contributes nothing to the story, and he's the only villain that doesn't get a buyout. In the Batcave, Batman sees surveillance footage of Joker's base while Robin tries to bring along a nuke that he ends up leaving. I guess some days you can get rid of a bomb. This level stinks. It's not always clear what the objective is, towing things around is annoying, and these stupid bombs never stop. It sucks. And on top of all that, the fear gas really works, because my worst fear came true. and the experiment room, where you can make your own custom character as is tradition. And here's mine. I present to you, Jodum. They find the seeds, and Ivy stays behind to lay in flowers. I think she likes these things a little too much, if you know what I mean. She wants to fight level 4, an enterprising theft. Lego Batman is awesome. Is it a masterpiece? Eh, objectively, no, but I would consider it a step above Lego Indiana Jones. The different abilities you get on both the hero and villain side lead to some really cool puzzles, plus the gags are hilarious, and going after the collectibles is once again a lot of fun. I'm really glad I got to play this game again, and I think you should too. Although, I really question why they decided to give literally every single villain in the game their own boss fight, except for Bane. Oh, okay, that explains it. Starting up, we can pick our character, and the roster is exactly the same as it was in Mario Kart 64, only this time we can actually see the character's stats as opposed to just guessing. Thank god I don't need a notebook anymore. The controls are mostly unchanged. You accelerate with the A button, brake with B, drift with R, and use items with L. And this is the sole reason I'm playing this on an original Game Boy Advance instead of the SP, because I'm pretty sure I'd give myself a hernia if I tried to play it with these tiny little things. And now let's take a look at the new items. This is just a bunch of cube drawings. Seriously, why did they feel the need to add so many Bowser castles in this game? The original already had three, plus we had a new one in Mario Kart 64. So, I can understand adding one new Bowser castle, but this one literally adds four. Yeah, four. Really? Why? Come on, Special Cup, we are so close. This is absolute hell. I seriously spent over an hour and a half on this one cup. It was one of the most miserable experiences I have ever had in a Mario Kart game. I haven't felt this angry since I played Super Mario Kart! But after throwing myself at the wall over and over and over again, I finally got through this nightmare of a cup. Here's the thing, when you unlock them, they only unlock for that specific engine class. Much like the special cup before it, unlocking the extra cups in 50cc does not carry over to 100 or 150cc. So this means if you want to unlock all of the cups in every mode, you have to play through every single cup six freaking times. You know what? No, I'm not doing that. These are considered extra cups, meaning they are optional. I got the alternate title screen for beating all the courses normally, I did the extra cups in 50cc, and that's good enough. You don't get anything else for beating the extra courses in all of the engine classes, so I am done. Hello, human beings. Power Hammer here. Would you like to take a minute to talk about Donkey Kong Country 2? Uh, <laughs> Honestly, the best response I've gotten all day. 
Since some people thought the first game was too easy, this one was designed to be much more challenging. Why does that sound familiar? He demands the banana horde be handed over, but Diddy Kong decides to save his uncle, so he heads to the Kremlin's home of Crocodile Isle alongside his girlfriend, Dixie Kong, who I should stress is from a different Kong family. I guess it's just a common last name, like Smith, or Johnson, or Renslayer. Remember all those other Kongs that were nice and helpful in the last game? Well, now they charge you for their services. Wow, even apes aren't immune to being corrupted by capitalism. Next we have King Zing, dang it. Rats, oh come on, are you kidding me? What the hell? How am I supposed to win this? Come on! Uh, dang it, no, 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 come on, you stupid little! Uh, fuck you, you stupid bee! This fight is fucking awful for some god knows why bullshit reason. During this fight, you don't actually play as the Kongs, you play as Squawks. Yeah, because he's just so much fun, we had to use him for the boss fight. Well, you have to shoot coconuts at the bee's stinger as he flies around. Sounds simple, but the problem is this thing is smaller than a fucking ant. So it's nearly impossible to even see the damn thing, let alone know you're supposed to hit it. I thought you had to keep chipping away at him, but nope, I was just wasting my goddamn time. And because you have to get so close to hit him, it is really easy for him to bump into you. And since you only get one extra hit, you probably won't last too long. But you hit him three times and that's it, right? Oh, no, 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 you poor innocent soul. He then shrinks and makes more singers, which spin around, and then you have to shoot those and then hit him another three times. If you take too long, the singers respawn, he moves faster as the fight goes on in both faces, and many, many times you can end up cornered because this shitty parrot takes eons to turn around. So by the time you finally do and shoot him, you're fucking dead. I spent half an hour on this bumble bitch. I had over 20 lives when I reach him, and I still got a fucking game over! So help me, I will rip out every single bit of your insectoid body, you piece of shit. Come on, please, let this be over. I, is he dead? Did I win? Yes! Yes! Go fuck yourself, you abomination of life! Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. Tonight is a very special night. A night like no other. Brace yourselves, because we are about to venture forth into one of the darkest and most disturbing games a children's company has ever created. It is an anomaly like no other, because it has captured as many hearts as it has scared away, both due to its dark nature and its impending sense. Of doom. Okay, I'm sorry. I can barely see out of this thing and there's no head strap to keep it on. You know what it is. The two then continue walking through the forest and along the way find the seemingly lifeless tree who just looks sad. Poor little guy. They speak with the happy mask salesman who whips a piano out of thin air. I do not trust this man and he teaches us the song of healing. Link plays the song and he has a vision of a giant Deku scrub as he waves goodbye to it. This turns him back to normal while also turning his Deku scrub form into a mask. The salesman then asks for his mask back and when he doesn't get it, he violently assaults a child. Remember how I said you had three days to stop the moon? Yeah, that's not just in terms of the story. You see this little dial thing in the center of the screen? That's your clock. Unless you're in a menu or dialogue, time is always flowing in this game. It's like Pikmin, or I guess more accurately, Pikmin is like Majora's Mask, but eh, whatever. A day starts at 6 a.m. and lasts roughly 18 minutes, and you don't sleep. When the day ends, the next one immediately starts. However, once all three days are up, this happens. Jesus! This might sound like Majora's Mask is laughably bare, but believe me when I say the dungeons are only a footnote of this game. While most Zelda games from Ocarina of Time and onward are about the main story, where you're going on this grand epic adventure across a massive land in an attempt to save the world, Majora's Mask is 
all about the side quests. And one of the most rewarding aspects of this game is figuring out which side quests are connected to each other and how to utilize that to your advantage. There's plenty of great examples, but here's one of my personal favorites. At midnight of the first day, an old lady comes into Clock Town when she's robbed by a thief. If you stop him, she rewards you with a mask, but she also allows you to purchase the big bomb bag from the bomb shop. However, if you don't stop the thief, he takes the big bag to the curiosity shop where it's put up for sale on the final night. You can buy it here, but it's cheaper if you buy it from the bomb shop. And if you stop him, what's in the curiosity shop instead? Well, that will be the all night mask, which prevents the wearer from falling asleep. And in the end, there's this old lady who wants to tell you stories, but you fall asleep when she does. So slap that mask on, and if you answer her questions correctly, you're rewarded with not one, but two heart pieces. This is part of what makes the side quest so satisfying. Trying to discover how everything connects to each other is so much fun, and it makes it insanely satisfying when you finally figure it out. The transformation masks are one of the best additions to this game, since they really help it stand out not just from Ocarina of Time, but every future game in the series, both due to the puzzles they create and the different ways you can use them. The only downside, though, is uh, the process of using them does not look pleasant. <laughs> Overall, this game is pretty awesome, but in terms of structure, there's only one thing I really don't like about it, and that's the save method. For some reason, you can only save the game when you reset time, and since you only want to reset at the end of a cycle, you won't be saving very often. There are these owl statues scattered around that you can save at, which also serve as warp points, but this is only a quick save if you really need to turn the game off. If you turn it back on and then don't save again because something happens with the game, you lose all of your progress in that cycle. And normally I would be able to deal with this, but because the universe hates me, I have this game freeze on me multiple times, causing me to lose a solid hours worth of progress. Yeah, that's my luck. The one game that keeps freezing on me is the game I can't consistently save. But thankfully, this issue was fixed in the 3DS version, so not only can you save at the Owl Statues permanently, but they even added some other save points and extra areas of the game. And people complained about this. Why? Seriously. How is this a bad thing? Why do people not like this? Is it because it makes the game too easy? Well, if it's that big a deal, just only save the game when you reset time. There is literally nothing stopping you from doing this. All this does is make the game more accessible to newcomers, and it makes it so you have a potential safety blanket in case the game glitches out. I will never understand why people bring this up as a negative towards the 3DS version. But there's one thing left to talk about before we get back to the main story, and I made sure to save it for last. Because if you know anything about Majora's Mask, you know exactly what it is. By far the most important element of the entire game. The characters. This game has what is probably the best set of characters in the entire Zelda series. I know that sounds like a hyperbole, but I mean it when I say they are fantastic. Almost all of the characters in this game are interesting or likable in some way. Some are really funny, some are more sympathetic, and some are just plain weird. Majora's Mask is such an anomaly of a game, as it's able to have comedic, bizarre, and absurdly dark moments throughout the whole thing, and none of them feel out of place. Plus, there's a great sense of mystery to it all, which makes exploring that much more fun. And because the characters are so likable, it genuinely makes you want to help them, which makes completing the side quests even more satisfying than they already are. In terms of both main and side characters, this game is absolutely fantastic writing. A lot of townsfolk are debating whether or not to cancel the carnival because some are convinced the moon isn't actually going to fall, can't imagine someone being that naive, and the mayor is caught in the middle of an argument, which is hilarious. The happy mask salesman is really creepy with his erratic movement and fast-changing emotions. The Gorman brothers, who run a horse track, seem to know more than they let on. There's a hand in the toilet, uh, I'm not sure I want to know, and I'd be hard-pressed to not mention what might be the most iconic character character in the game. Tingle. Tingle is a 35-year-old man who dresses in green tights and flies around on a balloon hoping he'll someday get a fairy of his own. And he is integral to completing the game since you need to buy maps from him. But there is a lot more to him than meets the eye. In the swamp, there's a photograph contest being held, and the guy running it is revealed to be Tingle's father, who's disappointed in what his son is up to. However, if you submit a photo of Tingle to the contest, he confesses that, despite that, he deeply cares for his son and simply wants what's best for him. And that's actually really sweet that despite Tingle's bizarre lifestyle, his father still loves him at the end of the day. This game has a lot of moments like this, and many of them all come to a forefront during the most intense part of the entire three-day cycle. At midnight of the third day, the final hours begin. The clock then turns into an actual timer, showing you just how much time is left. The sky begins to turn red, the ground continuously shakes, and the moon is closer than ever before. And the way people react varies wildly. Some people laugh in the face of danger like the construction workers, some panic and freak out like the swordmaster who, despite acting brave earlier, is found cowardly in a corner, and some tragically accept their fate, like the bartender who says he stuck around hoping that he would be able to see his favorite customer one last time. Who is his favorite customer? Well, the only one that was willing to come see him. 
You. Moments like this are what the game is all about. Ocarina of Time was about saving the world, but Majora's Mask is about helping the people. In Ocarina of Time, Link was a child who was forced into adulthood way too early in an attempt to stop a cataclysmic event. In Majora's Mask, he's attempting to regain that lost childhood and unable to do so because of the darkness in the world around him. Link has witnessed untold horrors in both of these games, but at the end of the day, he's still just a child. He lost his innocence at a very young age, but that gives him the motivation to carry on through the dangers in front of him. And despite the fact that he constantly resets time and essentially undoes all of his good deeds, it doesn't matter, because he knows at some point in time, he helped these people, and that's all that matters. The butler apologizes for going so fast, but he says you remind him of his son that he used to race with. Hmm. Wonder what happened to him. When we go back, we get one of the darkest moments in the entire game. We find the spirit of a Goron warrior named Darmani, who was killed when he fell into an icy ravine trying to save the village. We then follow him to his grave, where he asks you to resurrect him, but when you can't, he simply asks for his soul to be healed. Link plays the song of healing, and we get this vision of him being praised by his fellow Gorons as he bursts into tears. His spirit then transforms into the Goron Mask, meaning it's up to Link to carry on his legacy and save the village. We reach Great Bay, and if you thought the last part was dark, wait until you see this. Tattle spots a Zora floating in the water, so we go out to push him back to shore. He steps out, but then collapses. He then randomly summons the strength to play a song, which kinda kills the mood, but whatever, and reveals that his name is Mikau, a member of the Zora band called the Indigogos. He explains that the band's singer and his love interest, Lulu, had her eggs stolen by pirates, and he tried to save them, but was struck down and thrown out of their fortress. He collapses again and asks to be healed, so, like with Darmani, we play the Song of Healing. This time, the vision is of him seeing his love once more, and the band they were both a part of as they walk off together. Then, much like Darmani before him, he transforms into the Zora Mask. The spirit tells Link to get the eggs back, and Link even makes him a small grave. This is probably the saddest moment in the entire game. Darmani was a brave hero who fought to save his people, but Mikau was just a simple father trying to save his children, and he failed. This act of courage cost him his life, and he didn't even succeed in his goal but we can. Play the song for Lulu, and this giant turtle awakens, who's apparently a guardian of the seas. Hitch a ride on his back, and we pass through this barrier to the Great Bay Temple. And if you thought the water temple from Ocarina of Time was miserable, you are going to love this place! Instead of raising and lowering water levels, this dungeon's main method of traversal is changing the flow of the current in this central room, which is one giant whirlpool, and as someone who actually likes the water temple, I can safely tell you, this place sucks. The currents are super confusing to navigate, and if you don't do it correctly, it leads to even more backtracking than last time. Plus, the center room is insanely annoying since it's constantly sweeping you around, meaning you can unintentionally go the wrong way. No joke, when I first played this game, I spent maybe five minutes in this dungeon before going, screw it, I'm just using a guide. And this time, I just had it right from the start. The boss fight is this giant fish named George. Okay, I know it's actually supposed to be pronounced Georg, but George is funnier, so that's what I'm calling him. After that, Lulu is back to normal, and the band can perform, so, uh, who's gonna tell them? You get the captain's hat, and use it to convince these guys to open a grave where you meet the spirit of a royal composer named Flat, who teaches you the Song of Storms. You then go up the canyon and play it for his brother, Bass, which lays him to rest, and causes the water to flow into this music box house where a little girl named Pamela steps outside. If you go in, you find this nightmare fuel. This scientist accidentally turned himself into a Gibdo, and if you attack him, Pamela intervenes because he's her father, and despite being turned into a monster, she still loves him, and oh my heart! If you play the Song of Healing, though, he's turned back to normal, and the two of them share a really sweet moment. Plus, you get the Gimdo Mask. Hope you enjoyed that lovely scene, because the next part is awful. If you win, the two soldiers bicker, and then the king teaches you the Elegy of Emptiness, which lets you create these freaking-looking clones of yourself, with the normal one being the most famous. Aside from this stupid stray fairy that gives you 10 seconds to reach the switch, and I literally spent 20 minutes trying to get to it, only for the game to freeze! At midnight, this weird dancing ghost guy named Kamaro appears on one of the rock trees in Termina Field, and if you play the Song of Healing, you get Kamaro's mask, which looks freaky as hell, and lets you perform his dance. In Romani Ranch, you can find this guy who's sad the world is ending because it means his chicks won't grow into roosters. But if you use the Bremen Mask to become the Pied Piper and round them all up, he gives you the Bunny Hood, which lets you run faster. Well, thank you, buddy. Now then. <laughs> if the moon doesn't take you out, I will, you lousy little... Huh? Oh, no. No, 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 no! Chicken Swarm! Ah! Oh. 
Okay then. Okay, now let's really get into what happens at Romani Ranch. For the first two days, there's this boulder blocking the path, but on the third day, it's gone thanks to this guy. If you go in there, you see this little girl named Romani looking completely out of it, and her older sister Crimea looking really regretful. Once you get the powder keg, though, you can enter the ranch on the first day to get Epona. You see Romani is a weird girl, as she gives you the nickname Grasshopper, but she's still functioning, at least. She then tells you that every year before in the carnival, these weird ghost alien things come to steal the cows. She's training to protect them, and asks you to help. If you come back at 2 a.m., the aliens arrive, and you have to shoot them with arrows to keep them from getting into the barn. If they do, though, Romani is abducted along with the cows, and the next day you find out that her stone face is the result of them doing God knows what to her. This was meant to be a kid's game, right? Well, if you manage to fight them off, she thanks you by giving you a bottle of milk. The next day, Crimea says she's going into Clock Town with a milk delivery and asks if you want to tag along. Come back at 6 p.m., and she tells you a bit about herself, but then the wagon is attacked by the Gorman brothers, and you have to shoot arrows at them to prevent them from stealing the milk. Succeed, and Crimea thanks you by giving you the Romani mask. Unless you've already done this quest, in which case, she does this. Nice. That just leaves four more masks, but they're all part of the same quest, which I made sure to save for last. If you've played this game, or at least know anything about it, you know exactly what it is. Because this one side quest is so beloved and so famous that it actually got its own dedicated chapter in the Majora's Mask manga. And that is, of course... The couple's quest. As the final hours creep by, Anju sits in her room waiting for him, and with only an hour and a half left to spare, he returns, and we get one of the most emotional moments in any game I've ever played. The two look into each other's eyes, and Anju lovingly welcomes him back as they embrace. They then combine their masks together as a symbol of their relationship, and with Link and Tattle as their witnesses, they become a couple. They both know they can't stop the moon, so they tragically accept their fate, knowing that they got to spend their final moments with their true love. And with that, plus some extra heart piece hunting, we've now done almost everything in the game, but I'm not okay with resetting overall my progress. I gotta make sure the most important problems in this game stay resolved. It's time to begin the perfect run. Dawn of the first day. First we grab some rupees, then head to the swamp and heal Kume, talk to the monkey, then into the temple, beat Odawa, and save the princess. Back to Clock Town to speak with Anju. Now let's get that powder keg, open Romani Ranch, and talk to her. Go to Snowhead, calm down the kid, and take out God returning spring. Wait for nightfall at the end, get Anju's letter, into the mailbox you go. Back to the ranch, fight some aliens, cows are saved. Dawn of the second day. Head to Great Bay, save those eggs, back to town, talk with Kafe. Back to the ranch, save that milk, get that hug. Heal Kamaro, teach that dance to them girls, finish the eggs. Dawn of the final day. Kill George. On to the canyon. Beat the king, up the tower. It's on. Twin mold. Take him out, speak with the curiosity shop guy, get the moon's tear, wait with coffee, into the hut, get the mask, back to clock town, save the postman. They come together. Now it's go time. Eventually, Majora is destroyed. The moon vanishes, which I hope means it returns to his place in the sky, and we see dawn of a new day. Link wakes up and finds Skull Kid is back to normal, who happily realizes the giants didn't forget him before they return to their slumber. Skull Kid recognizes Link from Ocarina of Time, and the happy mask salesman discovers Majora's mask lost its power before bidding us a fond farewell. I still don't trust you. With their quest complete, Link rides away on Epona, and Tattle tearfully says goodbye. The credits roll as the carnival begins, and we get this amazing sequence where we see everyone we helped. The Indiegogos play their show, the pirates go back to business, the Skull Spirits are still bickering, the Deku King and Princess make peace with the monkey, the postman is free to make his own destiny, the sisters perform Kamaro's dance, this guy got to see his chickens grow, the great fairies have been restored to their proper forms, Romani and Crimea can protect their cows, the bomb lady is safe, the circus leader gets to watch an amazing performance, the music box guy performs for a large crowd, Pamela happily reunites with her father, and everyone comes together to celebrate Anju and Kafe's wedding. They all live happily ever after. Well, almost all of them. We then see the Deku butler crying over that sad little tree we saw at the beginning of the game, which we can only assume is his long-lost son. Despite all of Link's efforts, he sadly wasn't able to help everyone, because some things are just beyond fixing. Link and Epona ride off into the forest, and the last thing we see is a carving on a stump of Link, Skull Kid, Tattle, Tail, and the Giants. I'll be the first to admit, Majora's Mask is not a game for everybody. This, to me, qualifies as a niche game, where it won't necessarily appeal to everyone, but if you are someone who enjoys it, I guarantee you are going to have an amazing time. And I am one of those people. I love the hell out of this game. The combat is just as satisfying as Ocarina of Time. Most of the dungeons are really cool. There's so many interesting gameplay mechanics. The side quests are super fun to figure out. And it has some of the best writing and characters in any video game I have ever played. I've gone back and forth for a while on whether or not I prefer this game to Ocarina of Time, since while I think the good stuff is better, I think it has more problems with it. There are some parts of this game that just totally suck. But 
even with those, I can now say with confidence, Majora's Mask is my favorite Zelda game of all time. Though, Ocarina of Time is a very close second. If you're someone who can deal with the constant time limit, I am fairly certain you are going to love this game. If it's your first time playing, I'd probably recommend the 3DS version since it's a bit more beginner-friendly, but the N64 version still has a lot going for it. This is easily one of my top five favorite video games of all time, possibly even top three. But there is one question that remains. What would happen if the moon really did crash into the Earth? Would someone be able to stop it in just three days? No, of course not! Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. Just because you enjoy something that everyone says killed a beloved icon doesn't mean you can't also enjoy said beloved icon, right? Okay, I probably should have worded that better. Like many other beloved folktales, our story begins with Disruptor, the first title ever made by Insomniac Games. It was the first person shooter made for the PlayStation, and it did not sell very well. Shocking, I know, given how much of a household name it is today. Apparently Spyro's name was originally going to be Pete, but they worried about copyright issues thanks to this thing. They initially changed it to Pyro, but then settled on Spyro because an S just makes things much more friendly, like with the word Witch, or Ink, or Ubmarine, or Hit. After that, they share some dialogue with you and then disappear. And wow, this was improved in the remaster, since the original was really basic. The dragons all looked the same, and while some gave you hints, a lot of them were just a whole bunch of nothing. Even if you've never played this game, I'm sure you're aware of this phrase. Thank you for releasing me. No joke, 15 dragons say this phrase, and again, many of them reuse the same voice clip. Spyro's health is represented by his dragonfly friend named Sparks. Huh, the magic item from Skylanders is based off an actual character. That's neat. I'm sure I just gave many diehard Spyro fans an aneurysm by saying that. You can restore Sparks' energy by feeding him butterflies, which you get by killing small fodder animals like chickens, pigs, and of course, sheep. It's good to know sheep torture was always a part of this franchise. And as a bonus, in the Reunited trilogy, Sparks has legs, and if you stand still for long enough, he flies in front of the camera and waves to you, which is just adorable. The only thing's really added is you go are a couple of power-ups like these fairies that kiss you powering up your fire, and these speed ramps that let you supercharge which makes you invincible and lets you jump larger distances. But this is where I must talk about the worst change in the Reignited Trilogy. In the original Spyro's legs would spin around all cartoony, but here he just runs faster. I'm sorry, but this is unacceptable. Goodbye. The boss is Blowhard, a wizard guy that shoots tornadoes at you. And at least his level's a bit more interesting with the moving platforms. And do you want a great example of how limited the PlayStation 1 really was? This is what he looked like in the original. What even is that? It also has this one little jump, and then the original took me over 15 minutes to make because I kept just barely missing it. Screw this terrible jumping. Also, apparently, no sheep were harmed during the making of this game. Yeah, I don't buy it. The primary source of this game type was the Smash Bros. Dojo, a website that revealed a new piece of information every single day, and somehow it is still up. Now, I don't know what this experience was like personally, since I didn't even know Smash existed at the time, but I can imagine it ranged from... Oh, that looks kinda cool. ...to... Remember how I said Melee was the most popular entry in the series? Well, that's mainly in terms of the competitive scene, and a lot of people found Brawl to be really lacking in that department. Because of that, it has caused a massive amount of drama, since Melee stands are not shy about showing their disdain for this game. Saying you prefer anything in Brawl to Melee can cause a massive uproar, and it'll destroy your reputation faster than going to Bass Pro Shop dressed as a banana. Well, making me go partially deaf is a good start. Wolf from Star Fox, Lucario from Pokemon, Rob, that old NES accessory, and easily the biggest two of all, the first third-party characters in Super Smash Bros. history. Snake from Metal Gear Solid, which is an odd choice, but still a cool one. And of course, Sonic from Sonic the Hedgehog. This was game-changing. Being able to officially see Mario and Sonic in the same game together was insane. Or it would have been if this didn't come out a few months earlier. Honestly, the most amusing thing about Classic Mode is how many times the opponents end up killing themselves. Hell, sometimes you don't even have to hit them once. So there's not much else to do here other than go over the story. Oh, hang on one second. I'm getting a message from the future about what will happen when I've already finished the mode. What was that? Well, that's reassuring. Yeah, I would call this game a story mode if it wasn't for the fact that there is no story. The Battlefield Fortress. Marth witnesses one of those bombs get set off, so he goes to investigate when he sees... Meta Knight. Tabu is destroyed, everything is reset, and then it just ends with the actual credits. What was that? And that's about it for single player, so now it's time we move into the multiplayer. And you know what that means. You guys ready? Yep. Let's do this. Uh, wait, where's Vanessa? Dear beloved customer, we are disappointed to announce that the Smash Bros. agency has officially gone under, and as such, we will not be able to assist you anymore. Best regards, Vanessa Toll. <sighs> Great, now what do we do? Hmm. Please!
All right, fine. But I don't think this makes the game bad. I do think you can have a bit more fun with Melee, but playing Brawl is still a great time. That is, except for the worst addition to this game, tripping. Your character can just randomly trip at any given time, and let me tell you, that sucks. I'd like to see you go through an entire fight without tripping. Well, you want to fight me to prove me wrong? That's what I thought. Certainly not helping the fact is that Meta Knight in this game is without a doubt the most broken character in Super Smash Bros. history. He's fast, strong, has insane recovery, and four jumps, plus his up special. He's so overpowered that even the worst of Smash players can win with him. Hey! But both of these pale in comparison to the Smash Ball. This thing will randomly appear and float around the stage. As soon as it does, it becomes a race to hit it as fast as possible. Whoever manages to break it can then hit the B button to unleash their final smash. A super attack that leads to some of the most broken abilities in the game. They can be a screen nuke, turning into a more powerful form, attacking nearby enemies that lead to a fun cutscene, or just be completely disappointing. But regardless, it is a thrill whenever this thing shows up, and it's so much fun to use. That is, unless you're on stage where everything slows down so you can barely move, or one player keeps getting it with the same character and spamming it over and over again to a ridiculous degree. Can you please stop using Supersonic? Hey, I can't help it if I'm a natural. This is supposed to be a clean, fair fight. All right, fine. We'll all pick the same character. Great, everyone is Ice Climbers and we'll play on the side. Wait, how did these guys work? Like that. Well, T, that just seems a bit rude. All right, take that. Wait, why didn't you die? You killed the female one. God, I love the patriarchy. Screw the patriarchy. Mom, I'm sorry. And I really got a lot of use out of King Deedity. I was not expecting to do as well as I did with him. Why is that? Well, does that face scream destruction to you? Eh, I mean, kinda. Uh, how could you possibly- Wait. Oh, now I see it. But what's really interesting is that for the first time ever in the history of Super Smash Bros., you can make the opponents in Smash Mode CPUs, meaning you can actually have a fight against a random computer opponent without having to do the single-player modes. I'm genuinely shocked it took them three games in order to add this feature, because it would have made the earlier games a bit more fulfilling single-player-wise. Spoken like someone who has no life. You know, I'm starting to regret inviting you. Well, technically, you all invited me. One of the most noteworthy things about Brawl is the fact that it was the first game in the series to allow for online multiplayer, but you can't use it anymore since the Wii's online service has been shut down for a decade. However, you can get the exact same experience by just taking the footage and turning it into a slideshow. Now, many Wii games had terrible online connectivity, and apparently Brawl was one of the worst examples of it. It stuttered, lagged, and froze like crazy. It was nearly impossible to get through a match without some issues, so maybe it's for the best that it's gone. Well, that's a shame. I would love to experience what playing online was like. Mmm, here, here. Try this. Cool. And if you want to switch things up, we also have tournament mode. This is just a fun way to set up local tournaments. You can have up to 32 total players, and since everyone takes turns, you only need two controllers total. So this can be a great way to set up events or just mess around with a large group of friends. Though I can't possibly imagine getting 32 people in one room at the same time just to play Smash. You know, I actually tried that once uh, long ago back in the day. Hmm. Did you win? No, I lost instantly, and I spent the rest of the night getting high and watching Three Stooges sketches to cope. How was that? Well, I thought Mo was Curly, Curly was Shaq, and who's the other one again? If you're looking for something that will satisfy you and your friends' desire to just beat the crap out of each other, well, you probably need some new friends, but this game will suffice. Well, that's about everything for Brawl. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm kind of disappointed. Oh, don't tell me you're one of those. Well, this is a discussion that I've been trying to avoid this whole time, so uh, how about we just talk about something else? Well, we could always share some fun stories from our past. Like, for instance, the time I went to the zoo with my friends, they told me that I couldn't fight the lion. And I just had to prove them wrong. I had to prove my own masculinity. So I ran up to the lion pit, and they're gone. Either way, I'm glad I finally got to play this game, and I bet you'd have a great time with it, too. And at first, I did think it was kind of disappointing that Adventure Mode didn't have a real story to it. But then I remembered that Smash Brothers fanfiction was literally the longest written piece of English media for a while, so, uh, yeah, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Hello, human beings, Power Gamer here. We all know chickens are the most dangerous bird on the planet, hence my ongoing war with them, but lately I've been wondering what's number two. So, after months of research, I think I finally found the answer to what is the second most dangerous bird to ever exist. Eagles? Okay, third most. Hawks? Fourth most. Ravens? Fifth most. Owls? Sixth most. Turkeys? Geese! 
I'm talking about geese! They are vicious little creatures that exist solely to torment people, and nowhere is that better demonstrated than in their 2019 interactive documentary. It was first shown off at Fantastic Fest Arcade Showing in Texas, and since they didn't have a title yet, it was referred to as simply Untitled Goose Game. And people seemed to latch onto it, so it stuck. The only other thing they even slightly considered was Some Like It Honk, which I don't even want to think about that. When the game boots up, a goose pops out of a bush. And that's all you need to know. Yeah, this game's story is pretty much non-existent. You're a goose who goes around messing with the people of a small village, and that's it. I mean, I'm sure you could read deeper into that, but I don't think any of us are here for the goose lore, which is a shame because this essay I wrote is some great stuff, but that's a subject for another time. Either way, I'm glad I finally got to play this game again, and maybe I was a bit harsh on geese earlier. They're actually pretty charming creatures. I might never touch this game again, but I know I am never gonna forget that face. <sighs> Look out in the woods. They said you should stay away. He's up to no good. Ruining everyone's day. Here comes the goose. Here comes the goose. Now he's on my lawn. Drop my lunch in a pond Stealing glasses Wasting beer Spraying the hose Killing someone's rose Breaking vases Hurting people's faces Scaring the boy Wiping his toy I hit my thumb hard Get out of my yard He's taking all our things Before the church bell rings Watch out for your seat They said you should stay away Here comes the goose Ruining everyone's day Here comes the goose Ruining everyone's day Here comes the goose Ruining everyone's day Here comes the goose Here comes the goose Ruining everyone's day Here comes the goose Here comes the goose Ruining everyone's day Day. Here comes the goose, here comes the goose, ruining everyone's day. Here comes the goose, here comes the goose, ruining everyone's day. Here comes the goose, here comes the goose, ruining everyone's day. 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 Ah, uh, and second thought, geese are a threat to every living creature on the planet. We gotta get rid of them. <sighs> Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. <sighs> Nothing like lounging behind the pool on a nice sunny day. One of the many joys that summer can bring. Uh, I'd love to go on a vacation to a nice resort sometime, but uh, unfortunately that's a little out of my budget right now. So I guess I'll just have to settle for a pool behind some random person's house. Luckily they should be out of town for the week. What are you doing? Get it! Mario is taken to court, and Peach tries to speak up for him, but the judge is a jackass who finds Mario guilty despite him literally just getting here, and forces him to clean up the island and recover the Shine Sprites. But we very quickly find out that the real culprit is this mysterious doppelganger known as Shadow Mario who tries to kidnap Peach, but Mario stops him and he gets away. Despite the fact that multiple people witnessed this, confirming the fact that there are two Marios, and one of them was seen arriving in town just now, they should immediately 
immediately realize that Mario is innocent, but no, he still has to clean up the island because they're too pretentious to admit they were wrong. Super Mario Sunshine has some of the most lopsided level design I've ever seen in my life. Some missions are really fun to complete, and others just make you want to rip out your toenails. Uh, that is a disgusting image, I am so sorry. We're on the GameCube now, so thankfully the controller makes Mario a lot less stiff than he was in Mario 64. The movement is now much more responsive. Ultra responsive. In fact, maybe it's a bit too responsive. Yeah, I know this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I do not like the way Mario controls in this game. It mostly comes down to the acceleration. You go way too fast, way too quickly. Just slightly touching the joystick causes him to take off at full speed. And while that's not an issue when you're just roaming around, when the platforming gets tight, it is absolutely miserable. He can eat enemies with his tongue, flutter jump to gain some distance, and uh, vomit his stomach juice, which acts as the replacement for spraying with flood. And it can dissolve this acid stuff as well as create platforms. Grass. After destroying it, Shadow Mario is revealed to be Bowser's youngest son, Bowser Jr., who kidnapped Peach because he's convinced she's his mother. I feel like she would know that. He thinks Mario kidnapped her, so he used this magic brush, which is hinted to have also been made by Egad, to frame Mario for vandalizing the island. He then puts Peach in a balloon and flies away with her. So the true culprit has been revealed, and I think we should warn the cops about this, but they seem to want to do absolutely nothing. Why am I supposed to like these people again? And that's the end of the game, but sadly I've got less than half of the shine sprites, so we still have quite a bit of work to do, and this is where the game goes from decent, but occasionally frustrating, to <laughs> miserable. The process of completing Super Mario Sunshine 100% is genuinely one of the worst things I've ever seen in a Mario game. But then there's the ones that warp you to these obstacle courses, which can kiss my f***ing <laughs> There's the slide, which I guess is tolerable, running along this track with the turbo nozzle. Are you kidding me? Hunting down red coins in a field with no water, so if you run out too early, you're screwed, and this tile is nearly impossible to see. But the lily pad. <laughs> the lily pad. Just getting here is a pain in the ass, because you need Yoshi to ride these boats, which take forever and are a pain to jump on, plus you need to grab a fruit or else he disappears. And then actually doing it, you need to ride a lily pad down a poisonous river to get red coins and you can't take too long or else it disintegrates and you need to walk along the edge and jump which is nearly impossible but nothing compares to the absolute worst shine sprite in the entire game this f***ing pachinko game which i swear comes from the deepest pits of hell it sounds simple you just launch yourself up and try to land in the holes to get the red coins problem is the physics in here are utter dog sh the game pushes you to the left so the first hole is nearly impossible to land in seriously you can't even drop down because the game won't let you. I swear, this was not playtested at all. And if you missed all the holes and fall on the bottom, it's instant death. This place is an utter abomination, and I seriously spent an hour and a half on this miserable chunk of a And that is not even the end of it, because somehow we still haven't reached the absolute worst thing about completing Super Mario Sunshine 100%. Yes, worse than the 100 coin shine sprites, worse than the obstacle courses, worse than anything these horrible missions have to offer. The f***ing blue coins. Yeah, you remember these from Super Mario 64, right? You hit these switches and they appear for a few seconds, but they're worth 5 coins each, which makes the 100 coin stars a bit less annoying. But here, they're another collectible with a set number. If you talk to these raccoons in the hub world, they'll exchange you shine sprites for your blue coins and- WAIT A MINUTE! WHY ARE THE POLICE NOT GOING AFTER THESE GUYS? MARIO WAS ARRESTED BECAUSE THE SHINE SPRITES WENT MISSING AND HE WAS FORCED INTO COMMUNITY SERVICE! MEANWHILE, THESE TWO ARE ALLOWED TO SELL THEM ON THE F BLACK MARKET AND NO ONE CARES?! Are you shitting me? And they're not the only ones. There's loads of people on this island who give you shine sprites for helping them out. And it's like, aren't these things the source of your energy? Why are you holding on to them? You should be handing them over. Imagine if there was a power outage and the guy who ran the power plant wasn't willing to fix it until someone mowed his lawn. That's just ridiculous. I'm starting to think these dip don't actually care about the shine sprites. They just didn't want graffiti all over the island. In fact, some of these guys are straight up assholes or just complete morons. This one deliberately tries to trick you into helping him. This one is a neglectful mother. This mayor panics when his civilians are in trouble instead of actually doing something to help them, and this wise guy is on fire and running around in circles even though the ocean is right over there. Sorry, what was I talking about again? Oh, right, the blue coins. Yeah, they f***ing suck. These little shits are hidden all over the game. Some are just out in the open, some are given to you for helping people get unstuck or just bringing them some fruit in the hub world, some you have to spray random objects, some come from killing things, and some you have to spray paint and then run over the coin quickly before it disappears. There's 24 shine sprites that you get from blue coins, and they cost 10 each, which equates to a grand total of 250. 40 blue coins. If you try to get all of them, you're going to spend more time on the blue coins than the actual goddamn shine sprites. I spent 
hours looking for these things. Not only are most of them insanely cryptic, but some are only available during specific missions. I had a guide on standby the entire time, and even then, it took ages for me to find these stupid coins. And after all that bull**t, what do you get? What is your reward for going on that absurd journey to save the island full of idiots that unfairly convicted you? Well, upon collecting the final shines, right, your reward isn't given to you immediately. You first have to have a rematch with Bowser, but after the credits, instead of Piantissimo, you see this. Yes, that's right! After all of those shines rights, all those f***ing blue coins, every single one of those miserable stages, you are rewarded with a big, fat, steaming pile of nothing! You don't get any new levels, no extra characters, no secret boss fights, nothing. All you get is a f***ing picture. I mean, the 100 lives and sparkly triple jump for completing Mario 64 wasn't much, but it was something. It encouraged you to just screw around and make your own fun, which is one of the most charming aspects of that game. It certainly had more value than just a different end screen, and not to mention the fact that that process was nowhere near as awful as this one was. This whole journey was f***ing exhausting, and I am never doing it again. But it wasn't an entirely bad experience, so I would recommend giving this game a try, just make Make sure you stick with the main quest. Avoid those blue coins and extra missions like the frickin' plague. Honestly, I just feel really bad for Mario. I mean, imagine you're going on a vacation to a tropical island and you end up having to deal with all that garbage. Or, I don't know, maybe that's what was promised in the ads. Come stay at Isle Delfina, where as soon as you arrive, we'll arrest you for a crime you didn't commit because, well, you just got here. Obviously you didn't commit it. Enjoy the beautiful sunset from the view of your jail cell. Relax on one of our beautiful beaches as we force you to clean up deadly paint. Partake in one of our local festivals, which is being ransacked by a bunch of flaming animals that you have to fight. Explore our beautiful cove, which is polluted until you give an eel a dental checkup. Don't worry, you don't need a license for that. Take a nice ride down our beautiful sewage system. Visit our local amusement park, where you have to shoot balloons on a roller coaster, and you may or may not be transported to another dimension. Partake in a classic game of pachinko, which will make you want to punch a hole in the wall, and if you do so, we will be charging you extra. And rest easy in our luxury hotel, which is filled with ghosts. Planning on leaving early? <laughs> well, we won't let you until you finish that previously mentioned court order community service for your crimes. Isle Delfino, a vacation you'll never forget. And for a limited time, all customers will receive a complimentary hat and a discount on your first coconut. Well, in that case, I have a flight to catch. Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. I'm currently on the hunt for the rare and elusive Mega Man 6. It's a very mysterious creature that not many people have seen, but I know for a fact it exists, and I'm gonna prove it. <laughs> that sounds like my trap! So, turns out Mega Man 6 traps also work really well on Wolverines. Mega Man 6 was released on November 5th, 1993 in Japan, and March 15th, 1994 in North America for the freaking NES again, are you kidding me? Yes, despite the fact that we were three years into the SNES's life at this point, they still made this game for the NES, which was not a very wise decision, as since the NES was basically dead at this point, it never released in Europe at all until years later on the Virtual Console. This was so ridiculous that Capcom started a side series of of games titled Mega Man X that were released for the Super Nintendo, and the first entry released only one month after Mega Man 6 in Japan, and two months BEFORE Mega Man 6 in North America. Our intro sequence shows us that eight robot masters entered a worldwide tournament to determine who is the most powerful, however they were all turned evil by the sponsor of the tournament, Mr. X, who was apparently the one manipulating Dr. Wily this whole time. So Mega Man, of course, sets out to stop him from taking over the world. Yeah, a pretty basic plot, but they do at least shake it up by having a completely new villain. I mean, I know 4 had Cossack, but he was just following orders. Mr. X is clearly the bad guy. And the gameplay really shakes up the formula by deciding to become a first-person shooter, which was really ambitious for the NES. However, it also has RPG elements with a very complex level up system allowing you to change every aspect of your character, making each playthrough completely unique. And yeah, I'm just kidding, it's Mega Man again. Destroying it means his plan for world domination has failed, and Mr. X is revealed to actually be Dr. Wily himself in disguise. Wow, I am super impressed. That is a fantastic plot twist. I mean, I don't think any of us could have possibly seen that coming. Well done, Mega Man 6. Well done. He flies away, bobbing his eyebrows. And flies into another fortress. Oh, where is he getting these things? When it's destroyed, he, of course, begs for forgiveness, and oh my god, Mega Man actually captured him! 
finally! It took six entire games to get to this point, but Dr. Wily is finally arrested for his crimes. It's probably one of the least impactful games in the series, so it's not really a great sequel, but if you're gonna play only one Mega Man game on the NES, I say go with this one, since it gives probably the best experience overall. In fact, the experience was so pleasant that I'm gonna take a page out of Mr. X's book and start my very own Worldwide Robot Tournament. Unfortunately, it costs quite a bit of money, but don't worry, I have a solution for that. You see, a week ago, a Nigerian prince offered to give me his fortune if I just gave him my bank information, so he should be giving it to me any day now. <laughs> When did I buy $50,000 worth of llama fur? Hello, human beings, Power Gamer here. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Hmm. Bonjour. Oh no, it's my evil doppelganger, Phil! Yes, it is I, and I have come here to force you to play a bad video game. Oh dear, what piece of horrible electronic interactive media are you forcing me to endure? This! But I thought people liked this game, do they? I mean, you can never really tell with this one. Yeah, I guess that's fair. I mean, do you want to play it? Because I guess I can just give it to you. I mean, I guess. I you have suffer, played this game before, and I liked it, so, like, if you wanted me to be miserable, that wouldn't really make sense. Well, but, like, I, I did play the first adventure here, game, so it was only a matter of time before I got to the second one. I mean, you know what, sure, yeah, I'll take it. Okay, if you insist, give it to me. Yeah, take it. Yeah, sure, but thanks, I guess. Arrivederci. Anyway. Sonic Adventure 2. Oh, wait, hang on. I need to spin the wheel to see if everyone likes it or not. I don't think I have ever seen a video game change in terms of general reception more times than Sonic Adventure 2. I mean, people have just been all over the place on this game. It's gone from one of the most popular Sonic games ever to one of the most hated, the first really bad Sonic game, the last really good Sonic game, good with some bad elements, bad with some good elements, underrated, overrated, underhated, overhated. Basically, every single type of opinion you can possibly imagine has been given to this game. And Shadow is honestly my favorite character in the entire series. I know everyone jokes about him being an edgelord, but I think his design is pretty badass, his powers are cool, and his backstory is really interesting. But we'll go more into that later. I do kind of question how the military got Sonic and Shadow mixed up, though. I mean, the general population I get, like, they probably just assume Sonic disguised himself since there aren't really that many giant hedgehogs who can run faster than the speed of light and use the Chaos Emeralds, but Gun has a bunch of information on Shadow. They should know it's him. Eh, whatever, maybe they just want to keep it under wraps. Either way, it makes more sense than the whole Shadow Mario thing in Super Mario Sunshine. They're literally right there! After that, Eggman broadcasts his declaration of war to the entire world where the arc breaks open to reveal the Eclipse Cannon and fires a laser destroying half the moon. Wow, I'm sure that's gonna leave a lasting impact on the series. Or it's never going to be mentioned again, even in this game. Eggman is attempting to force the president to surrender to his Eggman empire, or else he'll use the Eclipse Cannon to destroy the entire country. Well, I know one potential president who would know exactly what to do in this situation. The cannon is charged up, and they decide to demonstrate his power. And again, this is the exact same cutscene as it is in the other story. Eggman makes an announcement, the arc opens and fires the laser, half the moon is destroyed, you know the drill. Then Amy, who's still here, decides to actually do something by talking to Shadow, who's totally okay with dying and humanity being destroyed. But Amy tells him that everyone on Earth deserves a chance to live and be happy, and this causes him to remember the promise he actually made to Maria, which I assume he forgot due to the cryostasis. It turns out that before she died, she asked Shadow to help mankind and give them a chance to be happy. Realizing that this shadow rushes to the core where Sonic and Knuckles are attacked by the prototype ultimate life form that Rouge found information on, the Bio Lizard. And here is when things get awesome. Sonic and Shadow use the Chaos Emeralds to transform into Super Sonic and Super Shadow and fly out into space to fight the final hazard as Live and Learn kicks in and oh man, it is so hype! The fight is you fly through space and hit these weak spots while avoiding lasers and orbs. Once again, your rings are slowly drained and you can't actually collect more. Instead, you switch between Sonic and Shadow every Every time you hit him and your rings are restored in between. This is a really cool final boss, yeah, except for the fact that the hit detection is really picky. Why didn't that count? But even with that, this is pretty epic. Once it's destroyed, Sonic and Shadow come together and use Chaos Control to teleport the arc back to where it belongs before it hits the planet. But unfortunately, this depletes the last of Shadow's power and he falls down to Earth to his supposed death. Sonic returns to the arc where everyone reflects on what they just went through. They all depart as Sonic bids farewell to Shadow and the game ends with this really cool shot of him on the planet. So. Is Sonic Adventure 2 a good game? In my opinion, yes, but it's not without problems. Some parts can be really janky and awkward, it has some weird design choices, and a lot of the levels can be way too long and frustrating. But even with those issues, I had a lot of fun with Sonic Adventure 2. Most of the levels are pretty awesome, the gameplay at its core is really solid, and while the story is silly and has some plot holes, it is still entertaining and has some great characters. I think this game could really benefit from an HD remaster, one that fixes up the controls and improves the cutscenes. But even with the issues, I really like Sonic Adventure 2, and if you're a Sonic fan, it is an easy recommendation, especially since it's going to be the basis for the third Sonic movie, which comes out in a few months. 
God, I cannot wait for that. Not since 2005 has everyone been so excited to see child murder. Hello, human beings. Power Gamer here. You know, when I was younger, I always thought I would start a band, but unfortunately, I was born without rhythm skills. Thanks, Grandpa. So I'm going to need something that'll help me hone those abilities, and I have a strong feeling that that is going to show up any minute now. <laughs> Sorry about that. There. That's what I was waiting for. You do get a practice before every mini game there to teach you the basics, but all of those use the exact same song, which is tremendously slowed down from the real ones. I mean, just to give you an example, here's what the practice is like. And here's the actual game. I don't know, maybe I'm just really bad at rhythm games. Okay, I am, and pretty much everything else I do, but this game ended up being a lot harder than I originally thought it was going to be, to the point where I considered stopping a couple of times and just playing something else. What? 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 What are you doing here? Why do you have a mustache? Just leave. Anything but that. Dog Ninja sounds like the title of a really awesome movie where you have to slash the vegetables by swiping up. All the things your parents force you to eat. Cucumbers, broccoli, tires, the works. And then the credits roll, which has a mini game called Air Border, where you jump and duck around these block things. And if we're wondering why the credits roll here, it's because the remaining 20 mini games are all either harder versions of older ones or more remixes. So this marks the end of completely original mini games, which is a little disappointing, but yeah, I guess it could be worse. It could be something like. <laughs> It's a pretty fun game. It does have its fair share of garbage, and half the mini games being repeated is kind of weird, but overall, it's a pretty fun time. If you're looking to try out more rhythm games, I think this is a great place to start, and thankfully, the first game in the series is significantly cheaper than some of the later ones. But for now, I'm pretty tired, so I think I'm just gonna kick back, relax, and maybe. What? Why is this game happening? <laughs> Uh, and second thought, why would I play a different game? I've been meaning to go back to Ratchet and Clank for a while, so let's just play some going command. What the? Uh, never mind, let's, uh, let's find something else! How about, uh, Spider-Man? Yeah, it's Spider-Man. I mean, come on, this game's classic. I mean, who the hell doesn't love- ah! Okay, maybe that wasn't the best idea. Let's make a different one. Um, uh, the, uh, oh, no more heroes too. Yeah, sure. That seems like a fun one to do. Ah! Okay, 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 uh, Switch game, uh, Switch game. Yeah, that sounds easy. Uh, uh, I don't know. Oh, Rocket League. Yeah, Rocket League. This game's cool. I mean, who is love- What? How is that even possible? You know what? I don't want to play video games anymore. I think I'm just gonna go for a walk. <sighs> this is nice. You know, sometimes it's good to just get out, get some fresh air, and not have to worry about that stupid kid. What the? How do I get back here? <sighs> it's you. You're doing this. I know there's something in you. What do you want? No, no, no. I am not playing you. This is not happening. I just gotta get out of the box. That's all. <sighs> gotta get away. Gotta get away. This isn't even worth a hell of human beings. Bubsy 3D. <laughs> Bubsy 3D was spawned onto this realm on November 25th, 1996 for the PlayStation, and things have been going way downhill ever since. I mean, think about it, would these horrible things have happened if it wasn't for this game? 
yes, they would have, but this certainly didn't help. Reception was weirdly mixed upon its release. Some critics actually enjoyed the game, because I assumed they were being paid off, while others were not blind to the garbage in front of them. Still didn't stop Accolade from using these out-of-context lines for the box art. I probably made it clear by now, but Bubsy is my most personal hated video game franchise of all time. I hated the first game, really didn't like the second one, and while I've never played this, I have literally never heard a single remotely positive thing about it. Ever since I learned about it, it is haunted by everlasting nightmares, and I swore I would never play it. But of course, all vows are meant to be broken. I mean, just ask the Catholic Church. Those guys should not be drinking coffee. Oh, wait, that's Mormons. Eh, whatever. This game clearly won't leave me alone, so the only way to get rid of it is to conquer it, which is something I don't think anyone has ever done before. Normally, when people talk about this game, they quit after level two at most, even though they should have quit after immediately seeing the game, but whatever. Someone has to show this game what for, and it looks like that someone's gonna be me. I'm not happy about it, but it's time we dive into the everlasting horror that is Bubsy 3D. You know what, actually, I just remembered, there's a new river that opened up nearby me. Let's go check that out instead. Ah, fishing. The most fun you can possibly have while doing absolutely nothing. Paint drying gloves got nothing on this. Oh, 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 I got a mite, I got a mite, I got a mite. I, huh? <sighs> well, it was worth a try. Let's go. Now, I am a person who doesn't really care too much about a game's graphics. Obviously, they can't help the experience, but if they're underwhelming, it doesn't ruin it for me, and if they're great, it can't save an otherwise bad experience. So, I try to be as lenient as possible when it comes to this sort of thing, especially when the game is fairly old. Now, with that said, look at this. Just look at this. How did anyone think that this was possibly okay? I know it's been beaten to death at this point, but I am still genuinely baffled that this is the game that got released. It seriously looks unfinished. This game is just a never-ending mismatch of random shapes and colors. Why does it look like this? Well, after doing some research, I found out there is an actual reason, and it's not just because they didn't feel like it. Apparently, the designers of the game wanted to have the best-looking thing they could get on the PlayStation, and by that, I mean they wanted it to have a higher resolution than any other game on the console, because it can only process so much at once, they had to sacrifice more detail in exchange for clearer visuals. I can kinda understand the idea, but they clearly made the wrong choice. The resolution itself isn't actually that good, and even if it was, it wouldn't matter because everything looks like it was made in an afternoon in Unreal Engine. I think I can say with confidence that Bubsy 3D is the worst looking game I have ever played. And if you think the gameplay will be able to salvage the experience, I really wish I could join you in that blissful fantasy you are currently in because of some unlawful substances. But easily the worst thing about the camera is whenever you get hit, it spins around to face directly in front of you and then resets itself. This is insanely stupid since you can't move while this is happening and it's really disorienting, so a lot of the time it just leads to you getting hit again. Most people say this game should have learned from Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot since they did come out before this. However, let's be a little fair here. All three of these games were being developed at roughly the same time, so they couldn't actually go back and fix what issues it had to make it more like those other games without completely starting the game over from scratch, and like I said, actually had them on a really strict deadline, so they couldn't really do that. But you want to know what game was out at the time that this game could have, and likely did take inspiration from? Jumping Flash. One of the earliest games released for the PS1, and one of the earliest examples of a 3D platformer. Not only did this game look better than Bubsy 3D, but it had a better understanding of what it was capable of. These levels are trying to have some sort of theme to them, but because there's barely any textures, everything looks exactly the same. Half the time, I can't even tell what I'm supposed to be looking at. The enemies in this game are so aggravating, it feels like you're tied up in a chair while someone's spinning you around and beating the shit out of you. You know what? I can't take this anymore. Screw playing video games. I'm going to become a painter instead. Welcome to the wonders of art. Today, I'm going to teach you how to paint a nice ocean landscape. We're just going to grab some nice blue right here and then absolutely cover the canvas in it. Make sure you add some nice ripple effects at the top. And remember, you can never use too much blue when it comes to the water. Now we're going to let it dry for a minute before we add on the second layer and then we can... <laughs> 
You do have some power-ups, but they aren't great. This lightning thing makes you invincible for 20 seconds, this cluster lets you shoot 10 atoms, and this outline makes you invisible for 20 seconds. This means enemies won't see you, but you still take damage if you run into them. Great. So far, this game has just been checking all the boxes. We've got bad story, controls, gameplay, graphics, music, level design, enemy placement. Is there any way we can make this even more insufferable? Ha ha ha! Oh, you bet your sweet f***ing there is! If Bubsy wasn't already one of the worst video game characters ever, it sure as hell was cemented here. He makes a bunch of quips as you do various things in the game, whether that be jumping on enemies, finding power-ups, or even taking a hit. And in the beginning of the game, they are insistent because it serves as a tutorial which just drags on. Now, if you lose a Bubsy, you'll start over here instead of at the beginning of the level! Hey, life crap! Yeah, I figured out this is a checkpoint, and if not, I would have learned it myself when I died. These jokes and one-liners are painfully unfunny, and they happen so many times throughout the entire game. You're already in a bad mood because the levels are trying to f*** you over, and then here comes this little sh** head trying to be funny, and he is aggravating because he almost never shuts up! Not to mention the voice acting is just plain awful. In the first two Bubsy games, he was voiced by legendary actor Rob Paulson, but here he's voiced by Lainey Manella, who's done a bunch of other video games, most notably Rouge and Sonic Adventure 2. So she is a good voice actress, but the direction they gave her, combined with the god-awful writing, just makes Bubsy the most annoying video game character ever! Will you please just shut the f*** up? And I have absolutely no shame in critiquing this, because even Lady Manella herself said this voice was irritating in one of her least favorite roles she's ever had. I'm telling you, even the voice actors hate this bobcat bitch. Nobody likes your jokes, so shut your damn mouth! To add insult to entry, the pause screen has a pun. This game is clearly trying to be funny, but it genuinely makes it worse, and not just with the quips. They have this little visual gag where Bubsy waves goodbye before falling into water. Yeah, sure, cute, but this actively affects the gameplay, because if you slightly walk off the platform that's above water, you have no way to save yourself. It's instant death. And that's very easy to do because of how slippery the control is. This game is just a bunch of cheap shit. The jumping has no momentum to it, so it's really easy to miss jumps, especially on moving platforms. The enemies are f***ing everywhere, and because you can't move the camera, you get hit by stuff off-screen. The hit detection for jumping on them is super unfair. And if all that wasn't bad enough, they can still hurt you after you kill them, either from their shots or because you both take damage for some reason! And of course, they can shoot you from really far away, and you can't even see them, so that just comes out of nowhere. I'm actually getting pretty hungry. I think I should go make some lunch. Today, I think I'm gonna make some fresh pasta and veggies. First, you're gonna want to set a pot of water on the stove. Make sure it's not too full, and then wait for it to boil. Now select a pasta of your choice. I'm personally gonna be going with some tortellini, and place it in the pot. While that cooks, grab yourself some frozen peas, put that in a bowl with warm water, and then place it in the microwave. Make sure you stir the pasta as it boils, and once it's ready, you're gonna want to grab some butter. Uh, oh, come on! I don't even get to eat it! You. The levels also have these rockets in them that you can find to build a rocket ship, but thankfully they are not required to beat the game, so why would I get these? Catatomic Catastrophe. I swear these names are gonna give me a f***ing aneurysm if the game itself doesn't. Ugh, this is stupid. Why am I doing this to myself? Oh, right. It's a shame, because there's so much better stuff I could be doing with my time, like, uh, I could go shopping! Check out your local mall, there's so much to see! GameStop, you can find games that are actually playable, or sell them for $2. The Lego Story, where you can spend four months of salary in one day. Spencer's Gifts, you can buy South Park plushies and a mug I can't show. Build-A-Bear, you can create life to something that isn't actually a bear. Hot Topic, you can tell your parents it's not just a phase of- Oh, son of a Mortal Bobcat is another boss fight against this woolly mammoth. Oh, I uh, yeah, yeah, that's really f***ing clever, you stupid game. Zot's nice, what does that even mean? Is this supposed to be a city? I honestly can't tell. Days of Thunder, they didn't even try to make this look like something. Woollyville Horror, okay, now we're getting into the really horrible levels. It's another street level where you need to ride on these bugs across water. It's stupidly twisty, the platforming sucks, and the enemies are f***ing everywhere. This level goes on for an eternity, and there's not a single shred of joy found anywhere inside it. I was on this level for 50 god minutes! Runaway Wooly is another rocket flying level with a bunch of branching paths, but there's only one correct route, and if you don't do it correctly, you're just gonna spend ages going around in circles, dying over and over and over again. Duh! Well, I've had to go run. Yeet! Dang it! But now, we reach the worst level in the entire 
fucking game. Bright lights, big wallies. The entire level is covered in water, so instant death can happen at literally any moment. There's a bunch of bug riding, platforming, and enemy killing. You have to hit these switches to make these three platforms move to continue onward, and whatever you do, don't hit these two checkpoints, since if you die, it makes getting back to the colored platforms much harder. Especially this one, since you have to jump over the switch while on the bug! After that, you can move forward, but these stupid f***ing enemies are everywhere, and you can't always kill them because they're so far away, and the controls are shit, and the platforming f***ing sucks, and I f***ing hate it, and if you got a f***ing game over, you have to start this whole damn thing all over again, and the son of a bitch never shuts up, and I spent a f***ing hour on this miserable pile of sh and I am absolutely losing my damn mind because this whole f***ing day is just complete garbage, and I f***ing hate this sh Complete dog shit! Every single aspect of it fucking sucks! It controls like ass! The level design is shit! The enemies are complete bitches! The mechanics barely function! Why the fuck did anyone think this was a good idea?! This is the worst piece of media I've ever had the displeasure of consuming, and I pray for the second it all ends because it has brought me to the absolute fucking breaking point! I seriously had no idea what I was supposed to do here. I had to look it up and find out that you take this extra path, which I didn't even see! God, this game is shit! I hope you know what you're doing! No, I don't know what I'm doing, and neither did the developers. Oh god, the final level. Please just make the suffering end. The final stretch has you run down a hallway full of invincible turrets. Because why make actual level design when you could just throw in a bunch of guns and call it a day? Then you have a boss fight against this giant two-headed woolly, and it is actually pretty easy. Avoid this energy that causes to fall, jump on these platforms, and then hit it three times. But of course, that's not the end. Next is this tiny area filled to the brim with turrets that, spoiler alert, you can just walk around. S tier level design right here, guys. But then you have to run and hit these switches while these little shits chase you and they are completely invincible! Yeah, thanks assholes. You have to hit these switches in the correct order. Green, blue, red, yellow. And as far as I can tell, the game says fuck all about that. So thank you, internet. Then we can finally fight the woolly queens, Polly and Esther. Those names are still stupid. Wait, why are they separated? I thought they shared a body. All right, it's Bubsy. Who gives a fuck about the continuity? This fight sucks. They teleport around the stage shooting lasers at you and they move so fucking fast it's nearly impossible to avoid getting hit. And sometimes it literally is an escape. You need to hit the switch to make four atoms appear, run into them, and then fire it at the queens. Hit them three times each, and they die. Aiming these things is really annoying, so just go for the atom in the opposite direction of whichever way you're facing, and whatever you do, do not stop jumping, since staying still for even a second will cause you to take a hit. The only positive thing I can say about this fight is that if you kill one of the queens and then die, they stay dead unless you get a game over. But that doesn't mean this fight isn't still complete shit. After you finally kill these alien bitches, we get one last rocket part, and another really annoying dragged out cutscene. Long story short, Bubsy was captured again, but escaped in the rocket he built. But he didn't have enough parts to get back to Earth and wound up stranded in space, so now the aliens are completely free to invade Earth, and that's it. The game just ends. There's no credits. There! That's it! I'm done! Fuck you!
turns out those rockets do serve a purpose. There's two of them hidden in each level except for the boss stages, and you have to collect them all in order to get the best ending, which means, yes, I had to play through this entire game two separate times. If the main game wasn't already horrible enough, trying to grab these things is fucking miserable. Some of them aren't that hard to find, you just need to take a different path, but most are hidden in absurdly stupid places. Some require you to complete an entire obstacle course, and many of them require you to shoot an atom at a wall so that it breaks, revealing a new area. And these walls look exactly the same as any other ones, so you gotta take a wild guess as to which ones hide areas and which ones have jack shit. And not all hidden walls have rockets, so you can end up just wasting your goddamn time. The only indicator of where the rockets are are these telescopes that point you towards one, but they don't say anything about how you're supposed to get to them. Playing this game standard is already one of the worst things I've ever done in my life, but going after these somehow makes it even fucking worse! These stupid things are hidden in some of the most cryptic horseshit places you can possibly imagine, and some of them are nearly impossible to figure out without the internet! Thank you so much, Random Speedrunner. And if you exit a stage or get a game over, you don't get the rocket pieces, so I'm gonna make this a little easier on myself by using a cheat code that gives you 99 lives. Yes, I am, and I'm okay with that, because fuck you, you son of a bitch game. But you can also tinker with the options and... Wait, what?! I could turn off Bubsy's voice this whole fucking time?! Well, that plus the cheat codes make this a bit better, but even with those things, collecting these rockets is an utter shitload of an experience. I hated every single waking minute I played this game the first time around, so having to go through it a second time while hunting down these horrible collectibles made me want to die. But I can't. I can't do anything. I'm stuck here. I can't escape. I can't stop playing. I can't be spared by the sweet release of death. I'm trapped here until I get all the way through this asswipe of a video game. I just want the pain to end. I want my suffering to be over, but it won't stop because I have to aimlessly run around gathering all these stupid rocket pieces which are miserable to go for. I know there's a cheat code that gives me all of them instantly, but I can't do that because the game won't let me. But after going through all 18 levels of hell, what do you get? What is your reward for going through this fucking torture? What happens after you go out of your way to 100% complete one of the worst pieces of media ever created? by humans! An ending cutscene that's nearly identical to the last one, but the only difference is instead of Bubsy getting stranded on another planet, he finished the rocket, which instead blasted him back in time, meaning the Woolies can still invade Earth, meaning all of that pain was for nothing. Oh. 
Oh no you don't! I'm done living in fear! You may be a horrible game, but I managed to take you out! I did everything! And now it's time to destroy you once and for all! You may have evil running through every single molecule in your body, but this is America, and we have something even stronger than that! Duds! Well, that takes care of that, but we're not done here. I'm going to end this. It's time to destroy this thing, once and for all. The deed is done. I firmly believe that Bubsy 3D is the worst video game ever made. I mean, sure, there's some games that are more glitchy or have barely any content to them, but there is genuinely not a single shred of fun that can be found anywhere in here. I mean, even some of the worst games ever made, like E.T., Big Rigs, or Superman 64 can be funny bad. This game is honestly just depressing. I've known about this game for around eight years, and despite never actually playing it myself, I knew just how horrible it was, and after going through the entire thing, not once, but twice, I can now say it fully deserves its reputation as one of, if not the worst video game ever. There is no reason for anyone to play it. And now, it's gone. I've destroyed it, and it will never hurt anyone ever again. Well, we've officially failed as a species. So long, everybody!